Saturday Prism Eye Rounds. This should be a fun uh, venture with uh, a group of us talking about difficult and challenging cases. Uh, we'll be going over some controversies, have some fun, <clears throat> ask each other some difficult questions. And we do want to get you, of course, to uh, give us some input as well. So please use the chat and Q&A as well. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jeb, maybe just to kind of introduce the, uh, the webinar, and then we'll get right into it. So thanks, Jeb. Excellent. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, our website is www.prismeyeinstitute.com slash webinars, and our email is ike.webinars at prismeye.ca. Uh, again, our, our uh, rounds are now officially credited. Um, just a brief note that rounds prior to last Wednesday, unfortunately, can't be credited. Um, I know there's been a few people asking about that. So, you know, it's only from that Wednesday until, you know, our future rounds that you'll be able to get a maximum of 2.0 credits. Um, how that works is you'll be getting an email uh, a day after the webinar. In that email, there is a link that you need to, to a link to a form that you fill out and it'll automatically generate a certificate of attendance for you. Uh, there's also a survey there. Please fill that out so we can get some feedback and uh, let us know what you think needs to be improved, if anything. Uh, okay, so again, brief review. We're either looking for a lecture, a presentation, or an article that you wish to review. Um, express your interest, send an email out to us. We'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, our website is up and running. Please take uh, good use of that. Um, you can access previously recorded webinars and you can also register for future webinars. Speaking of which, this coming Wednesday, May 13th at 3 p.m., we're going to have Cataract Conundrums, Everyday Cases with Uncommon Catches. That's with Dr. Amandeep Rai, followed by When Tubes and Traps Need a Little Help. That's with Dr. Devinder Grover. So again, that's May 13th, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we had previously talked about surgical feud. Just, uh, just to mention that, uh, unfortunately, due to availabilities, we had to reschedule it, but that is still happening. Uh, that's going to be on the May 23rd at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. That's the weekend after the ASCRS webinars. Um, so just a brief review of what that is. We're going to have two teams, international surgeons. They're going to basically duke it out. They're going to uh, debate over controversial topics and you as the audience will be able to vote for who the winner is. So that's going to be uh, educational and fun. You're not going to miss that. Again, that's May 23rd, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So today our speaker is the man himself, Dr. Ike Ahmed, Division Head of Ophthalmology at Children Health Partners Mississauga, Director of the GAS Fellowship, um, also an Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto. Doesn't really need much introduction. Um, we have Dr. Dima Kalash on his panel, glaucoma, cataract, and vents interior segment surgeon at Cité de la Santé in Laval, Quebec. She's, uh, she did her gas fellowship with Dr. Ike Ahmed, and she did her residency at McGill University. We also have Dr. George Durr, who's also glaucoma, cataract, and vents interior segment surgeon at SHIM in Montreal. He did his glaucoma uh, he's the glaucoma fellowship director at the University of Montreal. He also did a gas fellowship with Dr. I Ike Ahmed, a two-year one, and he's, he did his ophthalmology residency at the University of Montreal. Next, we have Dr. Alan Mofti, who's a current GAS fellow at the uh, University of Toronto with us. Uh, he did previous glaucoma fellowships at McGill University in Montreal and also at King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And he did his residency in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Then we have Dr. Valentina Lozano, aka Gator Eye Surgeon, uh, also a current GAS fellow at the University of Toronto. And she did her residency at the University of uh, Florida. Uh, we have Dr. Tiziana DeFrancesco, current GAS fellow at the University of Toronto as well, previous GAS fellowship, uh, sorry, previous glaucoma fellowship at the University of Campinas and ophthalmology residency at OLA. Okay, I'm going to give it back to you, uh, Ike. Thanks, Jeb. I'm just trying to get, uh, see if I can get live streaming on, uh, on YouTube, but uh, I think we're unable to do that, unfortunately. So we will have to, get, have to get started. I'm sorry that those of you who are on YouTube, maybe we can send a little message uh, on, uh, on social media that uh, those of you who are on YouTube to uh, join us on Zoom. We do have room, of course, for more people on Zoom. So, but uh, we'll have to figure out what happened there. I'm not, I'm not always having the best success with Zoom these days. Okay, well, listen, this should be a fun format. We have a, a lot of interesting cases that I hope you guys will enjoy. Um, we're going to uh, go through each case and, and have our fellows that are here uh, to give their thoughts in, uh, in what they will, how they'll manage this. Um, and then we have, of course, Dima, and we have George with us who will add their two cents in there. And that's going to be the format here. I hope you can all see what you're uh, on the screen here, and we'll jump right into it. Okay. So I want to present this first case. We call it acutely gas. This is a 68-year-old female who presented to the ER with pain and pressure over 60. The diagnosis by the emergency doctor was acute angle closure in the left eye and treated with mannitol and diamox 
they're referred to ophthalmology the next morning and seen by our fellow. This is the examination findings of presentation. You can see that they're both eyes that were hyperopic. The left eye had count fingers vision, but there was no RIPD that was obvious on reverse testing. The pupil was mid dilated. The pressure was 38 that morning. Microcystic edema, as you can see, this is actually the picture of that patient with some bullae. Uh, AC was shallow. The angle was difficult to evaluate, but appeared to be closed. And it was a question of whether there was any PS or not. And the patient has uh, one plus NS and otherwise uh, fundoscopy appeared to be normal through this hazy view. So let's just stop here and maybe we'll get uh, Valentina to throw her two cents in here about what we're gonna do in this patient. This patient presents with acute angle closure. Uh, they're in, the, they're in, your, in your office. Um, we have the uh, pressure here at 38. They've been given Dynamox and Manitol in the ER already. And uh, my question to you at this point is, what are the options to treat right now? And what would you do right now? Okay. Um, and I see here that I'm going to ask be, we saw some PES. Um, I do want to assess the amount of PES that there is in the angle. Um, like how many clock hours, how many quadrants. The pressure is still high. Uh, I would like to see if this patient had glaucoma before. So if possible, I would like to get a visual field test, um, an OCT or an FL just for, to assess for any glaucoma in either eye. Um, they, it, she's already on, on Diamox? Well, they came from the ER, so they, she was given oh, okay. a dose. Okay, so we got uh, Diamox. So only used um, all the drops, you know, uh, I would put them on, on maximized medical therapy. Um, if it's not enough, then you can still give them Diamox oral um, carbonic anhydrous inhibitor. Okay, so for this. Mm -hmm. Dima George, I mean, what is your initial management the morning of the chemins? They come into the morning, they see you in the office. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing right now to treat this patient? Yeah, so I mean, she's, the, the patient's first thing you want to do is get her out of the attack that she has. I mean, her pressure is 38, uh, given mannitol and, um, and Diamox. So hit her hard with any all drops that you have. Um, as well as put her on Dymox again, depending on when the last dose was. So my initial management, break, break that attack. So obviously you wanna make sure that there's nothing that's causing this um, angle closure from the back or any tumor or anything like that or subcroidal or supercroidal, which is less likely in these cases, but make sure you get a V-scan and then I would try to be doing a PI to break the attack as, once the pressure goes down a bit. Okay, George, anything to add? Yeah, I, I would be a little cautious with the PIs here. The, the iris can be quite inflamed and uh, sometimes the cornea of the view isn't great either. Um, one, one thing that you can try, uh, which is a little bit, uh, you know, tricky is to do a, a goniosiniculysis at the slit lamp with a, with a 30 gauge needle by going uh, through the AC. These are typically quite shallow. So in trying to go as peripheral as you can and snagging a little bit of that iris and pulling it out. And sometimes by just releasing those PAS, these are typically quite acute PAS in the sense that they're not very sticky. Uh, by snagging the iris and, and you know pulling it off, it can sometimes break the attack. Uh, sometimes pressing with a gonu prism as well, pressing really hard can sometimes release. Uh, so these are kind of ways. I, iridectomies, I know it's 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 what is taught. Um, I just sometimes am a little bit cautious of that. It can sometimes release a lot of pigment and uh, can be quite difficult in those very edematous uh, irises. I think you have to like base it on the level of comfort you have. I guess if you're comfortable with doing a paracentesis in someone who has a, share, a, a shallow chamber with, you know, there's a, cat, there's a lens there still, um, for sure, if you're comfortable with doing it, I think it's a great option and releasing the PS like, like George was saying. But if you're not comfortable, I think trying to get that cornea clear, whether you want to use glycerin um, and, you know, try to keep hitting the patient with diamox and drops to try to bring down that pressure for the cornea to be clear and, and doing a PI if you're able to. Uh, if you're not comfortable with doing a paracentesis. I mean, I, I know paracentesis is a great option to bring down the pressure and, and trying to release that PAS, but if you're not comfortable with doing it at slit lamp, I think, um, which maybe if you're not a glaucoma specialist, it might be, um, it might be a good idea to do the, the PI. Oh, good. So really good thoughts. Uh, I'm going to move forward and basically say that the initial treatment of the patient that was given in the office that morning was treating basically with the kitchen sink. Uh, Diamox, beta blockers, alpha agonists, uh, prostaglandin was thrown in there, pilocarpine was thrown in there. A tap was performed as well during that process and drops were added again. So intense medical therapy with a gentle tap was performed um, and, uh, and basically the patient was then uh, more comfortable, uh, the cornea was clear a bit and, and the patient actually was said, suggested to come back the next day. Uh, they were in the office for, for about three, four hours and they were stable at that point in time. 
Um, and uh, and then basically anterior segment imaging was ordered. So here's basically the imaging here. And again, this is the next day. This is a CAST CT anterior segment OCT. You can see the vertical view on the top here. Uh, and you can see the um, horizontal section on the bottom I'm pointing to here. And uh, they're on Diamox. Beta blocker, alpha agonist, examination is pretty similar. I mean, the corn is a bit better, and the pressure is 30, so the pressure is still high. So my question again, I'm going to go back to Valentina, is what's your next step here now? And you have the imaging now to give you this information, some additional information now, which we're lucky to have, of course. I, I just can remind you, the fundoscopy was unremarkable. Flat, there's nothing obvious back there. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to he he see here the anterior segment OCT. Um, we're trying to find the scleral spur because that could tell us like, if the angle is open or closed, which we can see clearly here that the angle is closed. Um, and now we can check, okay, what's causing this angle closure? So we have, for example, um, is this pupillary block? And that's where you can make a line from the, scler uh, from the iris root towards the edge of the pupil. And I'm not seeing much concave curvature of the iris, so I'm not seeing much pupillary block. Um, lens rise, if you put a line between the scleral spur from one side to the other, and then you check the lens bulb. Um, let me see, I, I am seeing lens rise. So if it's more than a third, then I think this patient is having um, close angle from, from lens rise. And okay, um, just, there was a question, why not use IV mannitol? And, and mannitol was given in the ER, but the patient's pressure was, you know, in the office was, in the, was 30 or so. It, I guess the feeling was they didn't need to have mannitol again uh, when the pressure was not excessively, excessively high and the patient was comfortable. But it's a good question. We do use it. Um, so Dima and George, what, what are your thoughts here? I mean, how, I, we have the benefit of having this, um, this view here. And I think Valentina did ask about PAS. And I'm wondering whether looking at this, you can detect anything on the OCT. Yeah, so, so, the, um, so this is a really nice uh, OCT here, pretty, uh, pretty good quality. Um, and we're seeing some PAS even on the OCT, on the, uh, on the inferior cuts, and you even wonder superiorly, actually, because all the, all the iris is like stuck on. Uh, I would suspect this PAS all over here, um, and a and significant lens rise. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people asking about uh, doing PIs here, and the PI is really helpful for pupillary block, right? So in these cases where it's mostly lens rise, uh, the PI will not do much. If anything, it'll just cause more inflammation. You may hit the cornea, you may cause some edema. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not super keen on doing that. This, this is basically a lens that needs to come out. Uh, so, or, or the slit that I'm trying to do a gordicinic lysis, but in the end, you're, you're probably gonna, it's probably gonna stick back down. So you, you probably need this lens to come out. Right. I, can you show the, um, the PAS so that people can see it? Can you just point at it? Yeah, I was just going to do that. Unfortunately, um, my annotation is not working. The setting was turned <laughs> off, unfortunately. But what I'm pointing here, can you see my, my cursor here? Yeah. You can see this bright uh, reflectance area here between the iris and the cornea. That's not normal to see that. Normally, you see the uh, bright reflection from the anterior iris uh, surface and the posterior pigment epithelium, I can see there. But here you see this area that's basically looks like literally stuck onto the back of the cornea. And this, is ident this, ident this identifies PAS. We don't even have to really see whether the scleral spur is here. I mean, on the other side here, uh, looking at it superiorly, you can see that the angle is closed. Tough to see sneaky may be here, but certainly here there is. Here I suspect there is also here looking at it nasally. And also the angles are closed. So we've got angle closure. The gonio would be a really important thing. Sometimes it's just hard to see PAS but we suspect that there is a significant amount of PAS here uh, in this patient. Uh, gonioscopy along with this gives us that concern and suspicion. Uh, and so that's basically where we're at right now. Uh, and I think, yes, a lot of people have asked questions about PI and I, I completely agree. I, I am really against PIs, I have to be honest with you. Um, I think they cause more problems, especially if there's PAS present here, they may not, they will not relieve the problem. Um, Valentina is right. There's not a ton of people block. If you follow the iris contour here, on the, on the OCT, you don't see this classic Bombay appearance. It's a little bit flatter and following that lens. So no question the lens is part of the problem here. And lensectomy is going to be the solution. The question is, what can we do in the office here? And this is where, you know, no doubt there's some, going to be some questions about what to do here. Um, uh, just one consideration. Um, uh, someone asked if this patient is, uh, has diabetes. And I think it, there is also uh, an important question. 
uh, I, I don't think you saw any neovascularization in anything, but uh, neovascular glaucoma can present like that. And like yeah, uh, the patient, great point. Uh, yeah, the patient can have like a angle closure with PAS, and you're not able to see the the neovascularization, but it's uh, it can be related to NVG. Yeah. So Absolutely, hundred percent. Great point. And think for all the other causes, right? Proliferative causes. Um, In this case, of course, both eyes were were uh, were were short and uh, and they had similar appearances. Although this side was an acute angle closure, but one hundred percent great point. I think Myrna asked, and you mentioned that tissue, which is great. Uh, question about prostaglandins. I mean, are they really useful here? Probably not. Really useful? Could they induce more inflammation? Maybe, but there, you know, there is some immediate action on prostaglandins that sometimes you can use as well. So, yeah. So I think as as George kind of mentioned from uh, uh, AR, um, <laughs> basically, um, what we did in the office here, we basically took the patient at slit lamp. And an immediate trick here basically is uh, to do a slit lamp going to seek lysis. Uh, this patient is phacic. I understand, but we're going to work in the peripheral part of the iris. This is how you do a tap, for example, as just you see here, 30 gauge needle. In this case, we're not doing just a tap here. We're actually going to use the needle to sweep to the center, catching the peripheral iris and sweeping to the center. I know this sounds a little bit maybe a bit cavalier, and I guess it is. That's why I called it purely gas. Uh, but basically, what we're doing here essentially is working away from the lens moving forward. Now, this is under topical anesthesia, we're talking to the patient. You can actually hear the audio here. Inferior, I felt was easy. And Dima talking to the just... Hello? Do we have a PI? We're talking about that? No. Oh, I'm going to make a PI too. I'm going to do a PI there with the needle, right? That's so great. So everyone's comfortable calling okay. those cell phones and analysis in the background side of the right now, right? Um, I let people come down. Yeah. So that's what happened in Fearly, and then it just went back. So basically, uh, basically we, we're doing this uh, sneak lysis to the slit lamp. Now we're basically grabbing the eyes and pushing down. Uh, in my needle, by the way, I have a little bit of air and you'll see why we have that air in the syringe. It's a one cc syringe. And we're basically taking our time. We're working here in the temporal quad quadrant through the temporal incision and sweeping to the center. We'll move along here and we'll basically sweep here to the, uh, to the center peripherally. So I can't, get the, I can't get the nasal iris, that's fine. If I can get 180 degrees open, we're gonna be better. And we do all this, and then at the end of the case, at the end of this, we'll basically inject some air. And that will keep the chamber formed. And we, and we basically now have, uh, hopefully we'll see, release the PAS. This is to show another example. This patient had a previous yeah, hang in there, oh, oh, case, I know. Uh, and basically uh, had, uh, <laughs> had uh, sneaky, uh, sneaky development in the chamber shallowed. And basically here you can see we're doing the same thing, working from an inferior incision at the slit lamp. So it's amazing what you can do at the slit lamp. It can be a temporizing solution. We did not want to rush in and do cataract surgery right away and lens surgery right away because the eye is hot, the cornea is swollen, the view is poor, uh, the iris tissue is boggy, the pupil is dilated. Uh, I, I, don't, I just don't think there's an immediate rush to rush into things. And I notice people are like, do a PI, go to do cataract surgery. Well, what's the rush? If we can temporize things and settle things down, it's better for everybody. You can see actually on the, on the OCT, you can see an air bubble in the anterior chamber present here. And you can actually see the angle is cr it's a crack open now. Uh, as expected, not nasally. Nasally, we didn't do sneaky lysis, but temporally it is. And you can actually see also, in, it also uh, inferiorly it is. Sorry, this, is, this is, uh, should be inferior here. And so you can basically see there's some part of the angle that's open uh, that we'll be able to manage it. You can see the pre and pre post going to sneaky lysis, the slit lamp. So slit lamp going to sneaky lysis, which some of you have mentioned, is helpful. Any kind of PI or dynam dynamic indentation will not release the PAS. And, and PAS is, of course, the big uh, problem in this case because any kind of treatment other than opening the angle with some sort of mechanical maneuver will not be enough. So here's the, here's the situation now. They're on Diamox and everything else. They come back and the pressure is between 8 to 14 for the next month. And Diva, you may remember this case. I do. Uh, this, 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 uh, this, 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 uh, this woman here. <laughs> um, remember her well, yes. Yeah. And she, she was stable. Diamox was stopped. Her eye was settled down. She did have some persistent corneal edema, mind you, but the eye was quiet now. And, uh, and, she, and basically, uh, we have the biometry here. And, and by the way, just look at the UBM here. You can see that she does have a pretty big lens. She also has some pretty big iris processes here that are present. And one, one's considering whether there's perhaps a mechanism that may include some anterior uh, insertion of the ciliary body. Um, but just to get to the point here, axial length, uh, 21.5, shallow AC, and a regular size lens. So this basically is a small eye here. Um, and, uh, and as far as plans, so what's the plan going to be here? Valentina? I will proceed with cataract surgery once she's quiet. 
Yeah, and anything, any other adjunctive procedures you do with the cataract here? Well, if we're thinking that this patient has a component of, of um, anteriorly positioned CLE process, then you can consider endocyclophotoplasty. And then you can look, I will certainly look uh, while you're operating with a gonial lens and look at the angle and see if you're seeing any uh, remaining PAS. Because if you do, then if it's more than three o'clock hours, you can do another gonial synuculysis. Um, George and Dima, this patient still has a persistent palliative uh, pupil. AR. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there you go. Right. And so this patient has a persistent dilated pupil. Um, would you do anything about the pupil uh, when you're in the OR there? And now it's been about a month since the attack. So yeah, I think uh, for sure you can th think about doing a pupiloplasty, discuss it with the patient. Um, because afterwards, her dilated pupil is going to cause her a lot of um, symptoms, uh, photopic symptoms afterwards. So it, it would be a good idea to discuss that with the patient and try to, to, to see if she'd want to have that as well at the same time. But for sure, I think it's a good idea because her pupil is not going to be reactive afterwards. And to not have all those symptoms, uh, glares and halos afterwards, it's a good idea, especially with when you remove the lens and put a, cat um, a clear lens in. And just for everyone, the reason why the pupil is dilated, it's iris sphincter uh, ischemia, basically. So, so the pupil will never come down. Sometimes they can recuperate after a few months, but most of these eyes, uh, they end up with a dilated, chronically dilated pupil. So I think it's really a good idea at the same time to do a pupiloplasty. Now, some people are asking uh, non-gas and glaucoma people, would you do a goniosyniculysis at the slit lamp? So that's a totally reasonable um, you know, question. Uh, if you're not comfortable with these types of procedures, you try to temporize as much as you can with the drops, mannitol, diamox. But again, the, the, the PIs here can sometimes be a, a, can sometimes cause you a problem. So this is where you have to maybe talk to your glaucoma specialist that's in your community or, or nearby and, and, and get a consult uh, over the phone, uh, especially in these uh, more difficult times to get consults aboard. But you have to you have to talk about this a little bit more before you start uh, doing lasers or or, uh, or uh, do surgery if you're not comfortable. Yeah, so just to quickly wrap up here, great, great points. One benefit of pupiloplasty beyond the dysphotopsia potential is it actually brings the iris to the center and it actually reduces the risk of PAS formation. So it's a great way to keep the angle open because sometimes they re, they re sneaky as well. Okay, look who showed up here. So, uh, so basically that's what happened. I have a question about that. Like, um, I remember there was one case uh, that uh, we did a, a cerclage uh, to kind of open the angle, but we performed uh, the pupiloplasty a little bit more to that, like in the, in the mid uh, periphery of the iris, not like uh, in the pupil margin. Yeah, so if the, if the pupil, of course, is, is, is uh, atonic, then it would be useful to bring the pupil down. If it's not, then, then that can be done as well. And yes, there may be a case like that later, so you may have, you may have let the cat out of the bag for that one. Um, and, and another thing that's controversial here, we did an iridozonulo hylodectomy, which I think is controversial here, meaning what we did is we put the cutter, made a PI, get, went to the capsule and the zonules, and removed some anterior vitreous as well. And we did that for a reason. Now, Valentina, thoughts on that? And why would we do that? Do we have the biometry by any chance? Like how big they are? 20, 21.5. No. Uh, um, yeah, we do want that just to create a unique camera eye um, to prevent malignant glaucoma. Yeah, this patient's high risk for malignant glaucoma. We didn't think they were in malignant glaucoma, but anybody with a clinical closure with a small eye, there's a risk. I don't think it had to be done, but uh, we, we decided that uh, we would do this to be sure. And uh, indeed, because of the small eye, I think it's helped. And you can see the, the imaging afterwards. And the patient has... Uh, has good control. So that's good. That's a good first case. Thank you very much for, for and contributing just to that. observation, but like in our practice, we usually use the, the axial length uh, cut of uh, 20 millimeters, right? I like to perform. IZ. Yeah. Of course yes. it depends on the case, but uh, when uh, the patient has uh, less than like 20 millimeters, we usually perform the IZHP to prevent malignant glaucoma. I Absolutely. think I remember this case, and I think the reason why is when we stopped the diamox, she kept her pressure kept going up despite having two slit lamp goniosyniculysis. So I think we were thinking she, she's higher risk for having malignant afterwards, and I think that's why we chose it despite the, the 21 uh, axial length. I think with risk factors for malignant glaucoma, which which I say happens a lot after these cases, are short eye less than 20, and also previous or recent clinical closure. When you have a recent attack, that eye is really not stable. Choroidal expansion may be present, and so it can be helpful. So that's typically what we do. And, uh, and we managed that case. So, okay. so let me move, I want to move forward to get through. This is a nice view of our city, of Toronto. Uh, this is a glaring problem, everybody, okay? And uh, maybe I'll, I'll get uh, Tissy to throw in, to throw in her two thoughts on this one. This patient 
is 59 year old male who's referred to our service. History of superior LPI was done for PACS, for basically quote unquote narrow angle. And since then he's very upset. Uh, he has disabling glare. He basically is des describing this linear dysphotopsia in the inferior part of his visual field. Um, this is uh, basically his appearance of his eyes. You can see his eye and his lip position here I put it in front of you here. And I want to ask a question about why does this occur and how do we avoid it? So this is post LPI dysphotopsia. Sissy, you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, sure. I think uh, um, just one question. Uh, is the dysphotopsia worse in uh, one eye or another or is it the same? Sorry? I couldn't hear you. Same, same. Same, okay. Because like, uh, so this patient has um, a superior iridotomy and um, it's not uh, super common that we found patients that are reporting positive dysphotopsia after LPI, but it can happen. And uh, the first thing that you need to access is the position of the PI. If this PI is all covered by the lid or if the, the lid is margin the, the aridotomy, because usually when the, when the lid is just margin the, the aridotomy, the patient has a higher risk to develop positive dysphotopsia. And um, uh, there's also, we have to access the symptoms. First thing is uh, if the, the PI is like a bigger in one eye than the other, and it's like a, like a less covered, or it's just like the, mar the, the, the lid is just like a margin, like a, in one eye than another, we have to access which, uh, which, if the symptoms is worse in the eye that looks like that the PI is the cause. And there's also one thing that is very important in, when you're dealing with these patients, it's uh, to kind of try to block the, the PI with the lid. So like if the lid is just margin the PI, you kind of try to lower a little bit uh, the, the patient's uh, like spear lid and ask the patient if the symptoms improved. It's one of the things that you can um, ask the patient to check if these symptoms is related to the PI. And also you can, you can try to block the light to see if, um, if it uh, also improves block the lights like in the in the in front of the like PI to check if the symptoms improve. Yeah, so I think this uh, I would suspect that this uh, positive dysphoropsia was related to the to the aridotomy. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to jump in. Sorry, I just want to make sure we stay on time. So I'm just going to jump in. You hit all the great points. Thank you for adding that. I want to add a couple of points though that that this this patient's symptoms happen right away after the PI. There should be zero doubt. Uh, that is from the PI or not. I mean, that's the history right there. So uh, the question is, why did it happen? Well, it happens here because you can see uh, the purported theory here is that we have a base up uh, tear film, sorry, that's present on the lid margin. And even though the PI may be covered by the lid, and that's why I do not think it's worthwhile at all to worry about the lid position here, unless it's really totic, because even with the covered PI, you see that we have bending of the light up toward the base through the PI, and then potentially can hit strike the retina. And you can see in this example here where the PI is, is, is covered, it's covered. But look closely, look, look really closely and you can see nicely on the slit beam here, you can see the, uh, the base up prism that's, that's occurring by the tear film here. And of course, if we just had the patient look down a bit, there's the PI right there, it's dynamic of course as well. And so when you see this, what happens is you get the uh, light striking the peripheral retina and we have this glare. Usually it's a linear glare inferiorly uh, or dysphotopsia. Um, here's an example of a patient here. Uh, where's the PI? Well, it's, it's close to 12 o'clock. It's right there. It's pretty small. In fact, some people actually argue that if you do a bigger PI here, it actually resolves the symptoms. And why is that? Because we have uh, less diffraction through that small, small opening, uh, and it may actually reduce the focality of that, of that light um, and the bending of the light. So here's basically uh, the case, a, a case, again, the patient who's got, you know, this variable positioning of the lid uh, which can which can cause these problems, and so the answer here, yes, is to basically do uh, temporal PIs fully uncovered. There's no tear near it, and the light basically is defocused in the vitreous. And here's an example of a temporal PI, as we show there. There it is there, and we did a, a big study. Vanessa Vera was the first author. I don't know if Vanessa's here, but uh, basically this oh, she is here. So uh, this was an important publication, I think, between fellow uh, eyes between between the patient. And basically one eye was superior, one eye was temporal. And we found that uh, the incidence was much less in the eye that had a temporal PI. Some studies uh, have kind of uh, maybe uh, have looked at this and had some different, different results, probably depends on the study population. 
But this is the only randomized study that's intrapatient, meaning within the patient's own control here, which I think is, a, is the difference. And yes, as Oksana asked, we can certainly do this nasally. Nasally works perfectly fine and well. But be careful here because uh, I, get, I get calls from people and they say, I did temporal PI, I still get this photopsy. Well, look at this patient. This patient's tear, mar tear meniscus is right temporal, right? His lid margin is right at the temporal area. So don't do it here. In fact, this patient may actually do better placing a superiority because that lid is really, really dropped unless they're going to get a ptosis repair, of course. Uh, and so essentially, uh, be careful, of course, with lid positions. Let's go back to this patient uh, to, uh, to see we have this patient who's got this, this problem here. Uh, this, is the, this is more findings. I remember, remind you, he's 59 years old. He has a superior patent PI, plus one, 2020. Pressures are fine. AC slightly shallow. The, grade, the angles are grade zero. You can see here on the, uh, on the, on the picture here on the, on the, on the OCT. The, uh, the angle closure here, the, uh, the uh, spur will be down to here. There's a spur. And if we go up here, this is basically the meshwork. It's basically, you know, closed, oppositionally closed. Otherwise, unremarkable. There's the, there's the OCT. There's the visual field. So what do we do next? This patient's not happy. Yeah, so like uh, regarding the, the PAS part, uh, the, um, uh, I would just observe because this patient has... There's no PAS. There's no, there's no, no. PAS. Regarding the PACS status, that this patient is PACS, right? So yes. I would just observe because uh, the pressure is good, uh, the angles are still close, but no PAS. I've just observed. And regarding the positive dysphoropsia, I think we could uh, give the patient a few options. The first option, this patient, we can offer this patient to use um, a color contact lens to kind of block this, uh, the, this PI. There's an option. Not sure if the patient is, would be comfortable using contact lens, but it's an option. Second option, a cornea tattoo also could um, try to block this, uh, the light that is coming through the, through the, uh, the aridotomy. Yeah, I would think about these two options or a contact lens or cornea tattoo. If okay, Dima add, George. Yeah, I was going to say, if you could add, you can probably consider doing a FACO here, uh, 59 years old, hyperope, low hyperope. Uh, I mean, I, I think it, it all depends on your, your pre-op discussion with the patient. These are where the expectations are really important to, to, to discuss. And the time of FACO, sometimes just FACO alone with the fibrosis of the capsule, it'll block that, that area. But if you want to be a little bit more gassy, you can, uh, you can do a little uh, suture, uh, which are quite, are quite challenging, actually, those, those sutures, because you have to go um, quite peripheral with your uh, pupiloplasty bites. But that's, uh, that's an option as well. Yeah, great points. Uh, and, and so let me ask you a question. Why would cataract surgery solve the problem? I agree with you, but why would it? So in this case, the, there's going to be fibrosis of the capsule most, most of the time. And this, may this will block the light that's coming, the aberrant light that's coming through that, uh, that uh, prism effect, basically. Yes, capsule fibrosis, arm rings, and everything else that happens in there, too. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's, those are great points to mention there. And by the way, this, this was done uh, quite a while. This wasn't just uh, uh, within a month. We know that these can get better over time. So definitely wait and observe and, and manage that. So yeah, basically we went, we went, with, we went to, to get some ink. Um, now there are a variety of different reports and, and, and publications on what ink to use. It's important to use something that is medical grade. It can be, uh, it can be sterilized. And the, most of the time, what our experience has been basically using a carbon-based ink like India ink, carbon oxide can be used. Uh, Davidson Marketing Systems, a specific company that uses it, makes tissue dye for uh, laboratory specimens, uh, can be used. Uh, you can go on their website, um, and basically that's what you can do. And we tip, I guess you could color it. I don't find the color really helps. I think it makes it worse, actually. But black is what we use. And I do tell patients, listen, you're gonna, it's going to be a little black mark on the, on the cornea. And that's important to know that. So here's a video. Um, this is uh, at the slit lamp again. I, I love the slit lamp. I, I can do surgery at the slit lamp if, I, if we had to. Uh, we're comfortable at it. And basically, I'm using a small little groove here just to make a little cut in the uh, cornea, just limbus in the cornea, just uh, peripheral to where we're going to make the, um, the dye. There's different ways I've been described, by the way. Some have described deepithelializing the, 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 uh, the uh, cornea and placing the dye there. Some have uh, done stromal punctures. I like to make a little, little corneal tunnel. So that's a 300 micron groove that I made. I happen to have an LRI blade that I use. So I use my LRI blade. It's a set marked blade. And then this is just a crescent blade. We're going to dissect down into the, uh, into, the, into the cornea. And again, yes, this can be done in the OR, of course, as well. But 
we have limited OR resources, and so we we did it at the stunt lamp. And there's just just make a you know a millimeter and a half. Make sure you get enough to cover the uh, central extent of the PI, uh, and then we basically have our groove there. And on the 30 gauge needle, I'll basically then place the 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 uh, the die. This is a black die. It's an India ink, and essentially go into that groove. Try to get into the uh, anterior extent of the groove, and then inject. So uh, James Murphy wants to see a video. Here's a video to show you. And uh, just inject a small amount. Some of it will end up on the surface of the eye, no problem. A little Q-tip can help to push the eye down as well as dab it away. And just take your time and just inject and just fill up that space. You're filling this corneal tunnel with the, uh, with the ink. Sometimes you have to go back and do a bit of extra if you need to. I, I warn patients sometimes, and sometimes they can fade, but the carbon-based um, ink seems to do pretty well. There's a bit of ink that's on the surface. Don't worry, it won't, won't stick to the conch. Uh, it'll, it'll wash away very quickly. And basically we've, uh, we've done the procedure here. So there you see, see how dark it is there? All right, so that's, that's, this is now looking at it uh, after, the, uh, after I think a few weeks that was done. You can see the positioning of it. And uh, this is uh, another patient you can see post corneal tattoo. And, uh, and this basically resolves this patient's problem completely. Although if you, look, if you lift up his lids, of course, you can see the little black mark. So corneal tattoo uh, certainly can, can be very effective. And I agree, of course, FACO could certainly solve that problem. So any other comments from you, George, or, or Dima from the, from, the, from the chat group as well, if anything came up? Okay. I think this is an important uh, just learning point on how to do these, uh, these tattoos. I think this is something that's amenable to most, uh, most ophthalmologists. Yeah, and again, it can be done in the OR as well, so keep that in mind. Okay, let's move to the next case. This case is called a little too close for comfort. We'll get Allah Mufti to, to give us two cents in here. 38-year-old, previous myope. He's minus two before from what we know. He's monocular when he comes to see us. He was referred from by his VR surgeon. Um, and he's had previous RDs, his fellow eyes prosthetic because he had uh, bad retinal detachment. He's had a history in the right eye of why he's referred to us basically uh, of a secondary spinal fixated lens uh, two years ago, but he's had persistent vitreous hemorrhage and hyphemas that are occurring in this patient. His pressure, his vision is fantastic, uncorrected actually, 2025, and his pressure is 13. Uh, this is the um, this is the uh, the uh, UBM just to show you the position of the lens as you can see it there, and this is the uh, just the biometry to show that the left eye is prosthetic as you can see, but 24.9 axial length. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, AC depth is 4.98. So question for you, Allah, is what are the options for this patient? What's happening? What would you recommend? So obviously, Ike, if you put again the uh, UVM, uh, interestingly, what you'll see, although this is a deep chamber eye and a myopic patient, you can see that the scleral suture die well is um, kind of seated anteriorly and it's touching the iris. There is no lens valve between the iris and, and the, between the pupil and the lens. And I kind of wonder in these cases if the patient is actually experiencing symptoms of uh, UGG syndrome, uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome. Uh, so it would be interesting to look at the lens and figure out if there is uh, like uh, a fake pseudophacodinesis, there's pigment liberation, TID defects, um, and if actually the lens is stable and not actually like uh, dislocated or like have loose sutures, for example. Um, in, in terms of option, it, it will depend on the uh, findings that they'll have. But probably uh, one, one option I would consider would be LPI. Uh, it had been um, uh, described before to resolve um, reverse pupillary block in uh, patients with Doug syndrome. Um, I would consider if this eye will needs to be exchanged, for example, uh, that's one thing. Uh, observation for the patient. Uh, for the symptoms, if it would resolve or not. Um, I guess that's pretty it. Yeah, I mean, let me add, let me add a few points and I'm gonna get Dima and George to throw, in, to throw their two cents in here. So uh, yeah, this lens was not mobile. It was pretty, it was pretty stable. Uh, and uh, he had, a, he had um, a brown iris, so it was really not easy to see uh, uh, the, any, any particular TI defects, but he had persistent like vitreous hemorrhage and hyphemas and it was, it was really a problem, and I and I think observation is definitely could be done. It didn't have any glaucoma or pressure, but it was getting pretty bad, and he was really wanting to do something about it. So good point. Um, anybody want to throw in their two cents? You mentioned LPI. Now, now either either yourself or George or Dima. Maybe I'll go to the panelists and ask them what they think about PIs. Would it, would a PI be an option here, and why would it be a, of help? So 
So sometimes with the PIs, the thought is that it, it basically breaks the reverse pupillary block on the lens uh, with the iris there. Um, so in this case, if you if you think that it's stuck onto the lens um, based on with, with with some P, like um, posterior synechiae, then I don't think it it would help in this case as much. Uh, Alan Carlson, always always astute, uh, talked about the consideration for new vascularization uh, at the incision and of course, just broadly as well. And I think it's absolutely a valid concern. And he was basically worked over and, and, and looked very closely. Um, certainly posteriorly, um, that, was, uh, that was important, retinal tears and everything else. But Alan's specifically talking about uh, NB at the incision in the internal part of the incision. And, and that can certainly lead to recurrent bleeding. We've seen that. Uh, and, it's, and it's a very, um, very valuable point. Alan talks about the was about by, reported by Waski back in the Estra cap era, which was before my era, but I think it's absolutely valuable. This patient didn't have any blood dyscrasias either. Um, so, so Steve Saffron, myself, and Harman Jeet, and other few other people published uh, a paper on on the use of PI in patients who have uh, recurrent uh, hyphemas or, or optic capture, and and these happen in susceptible eyes, post retractomized eyes, higher myopic eyes, and with IOLs that are placed in the sulcus or still fixated. And, uh, and these, these irises are more mobile. Uh, they develop this reverse pupil block phenomena where basically they get this pupil block at the iris uh, IOL junction and the iris bows back and basically rubs on the back of that, uh, on, the, on the anterior aspect of the lens. And this causes recurrent pigment dispersion or hyphemas. And we found when we did a PI in these patients that actually we were able to counteract the reverse pupil block and actually resolve the problem in many cases. Now it doesn't always resolve it, but I, I totally agree, and Jason Jones is mentioning this, this patient should have a PI. I, I think anybody who has uh, a scleral fixated lens, Yamani or otherwise, or sutured, uh, or even possibly a sulcus lens, if they get this problem, should have a PI. And this is something I didn't quite appreciate until, until later on when we reported our findings, that this is a phenomenon that can occur. This can save the grief of doing more surgery. So do a PI first, 100%. This patient actually had a PI. I didn't mention that on purpose, and I'm glad all of you very correctly Identify that as the first step. Totally agree with you. Um, George, um, I'm going to throw it over to you. So the patient has a PI. He, he wants to do something here. The pyphemas are bad. The vitreous images are bad. He's monocular, young guy. What, what are your surgical options here? Yeah, so these are a, a little bit challenging. Uh, depending on what type of sutures that were, were used to, to scleral suture this, uh, this lens, if it's uh, Gore-Tex or Proline, um, these, these can be a little bit more challenging to, uh, to cut and, and, uh, and reposition. Uh, one way is just to push the whole IOL back with some kind of some uh, sutures across the, the, uh, in the sulcus, basically pushing the whole, um, bag IOL complex down kind of like, uh, mattress sutures, uh, across the AC. So uh, across the sulcus, um, these can, can be helpful if you want to avoid removing the lens completely. And if you want to remove it, then you can remove it in place either an, uh, an artisan or an ACIOL or uh, do a Yamane or, or a, uh, another type of uh, fixated uh, or, or scleral fixated lens. But you want to make sure that you're a little bit more posterior in your, uh, in your grooves. Yeah, very good points. Um, notice, by the way, the white to white 12.2. It's a little larger than, than the average here. Um, and so, yeah, basically what we ended up doing is we, we didn't want to get into taking this lens out. This is a clear fix to the lens. It's going to get messy. He's got a risk already. Um, and it'd be more involved. Of course, this is the PMMA lens in this case, because it was sort of fixated with sutures. Um, and so we want to avoid it. You can just see that, you know, just it's in 2D, view, 2D video here, but you can basically see that that, that that lens is sitting right behind that iris. And, and you can see my Kuglin hook trying to move it away. And I can't even get the iris because it's just touching that lens. There's the lens you can see there. I mean, it is not mobile, but it's anteriorly positioned. And this is a big issue with still fixing the lenses. Even Yamani is we often fixate the lens too anterior. Two millimeters back from the limbus is often not enough for these perhaps longer eyes. And we have to think more about looking at things like the end of the blue zone to look at landmarks. So as George uh, said, uh, this would be a great case to, uh, to fixate uh, a suture. Now, I just want to point out a few things here. Look, look at the... Um, let me just, let me look at the landmarks here. So we took down the, we took down the, uh, the conge. Let me look at the landmarks here. And I'm going to just point out a couple of things here. So first of all, this is the limbus here. I'm pointing out the blue zone here. Okay. And we want to go back a millimeter and a half in this case from the end of the blue zone. I'm just pointing out right there. Okay. That's the end of the blue zone. 
I want to go back and look because this patient basically has a pretty deep AC. And so we have to go back to ensure that uh, we keep that lens away from the iris. Now I'm going even farther back because I'm going to be putting a, a mattress suture. But if I was doing this again, fixating it, I go 1.5 millimeters back from that, uh, from not the limbus, but from the end of the blue zone, again, right here. Again, like I said, I'm going a little bit farther back and you'll see why in this case, because I'm not suturing the lens itself, I'm putting a mattress suture. So here I'm using nanoproline. I didn't use Gore-Tex because I, um, I wanted to use something that was a little lower profile. And I can't get the needle all the way across the AC. It's a huge AC, right? So I'm going to basically help myself by essentially going it in two steps, going out through the main incision and then back in again, and then basically docking the nanoproline, which is on a CTC6 needle, which docks nicely with a 26 gauge hypodermic. Always match your, um, your, uh, your needle with the bore size of the hypodermic if you're using the docking technique. Just over two millimeters apart, you want a nice screw, that's just more three millimeters apart. We're gonna go across again. I can't get all the way across the dock it, so I'm gonna again use another incision to do this in two steps, the two step pass. And basically we then go back here again and you can all kind of get the idea. I'm gonna then tie the suture now. It would've been nice to have intraoperative OCT, it would have been cool to see the positioning of the lens. But I can basically, again, use the gauge using my Coogan hook along the iris margin to see if there's a gap after this. And I'm going to do a slip knot here to basically slip it down. And you can see now I can push the iris really nicely over because I've got space now that I've created by pushing down that lens. This is a fairly low uh, invasive approach. I hope it's safer for the patient. I did tie it a bit extra tight. And I'm going to ask uh, Ala what the refractive outcome is going to be in this patient. Um, when I do this, and you can see where we're able to manage this case with sutures. This is the, um, is the position of the lens. You can see nicely the position of the lens. And just to show you uh, the uh, pre and post-op positions, you can see how we've gone back probably about maybe about a millimeter from where it was just with these mattress sutures. Although what's gonna happen to the, to the refractive outcome? So because the lens goes back, it, um, you expect to have uh, more, to the myopic side, I would say. More of the myopic side. What do you think, Tissy? The hyperopic. 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 Right. Hyperopic. Valentina, who's right? I, I love my fellows getting arguments. It's amazing to watch it. We don't argue, by the way. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I go with Tissy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ella. The Latinas always hang out together. I feel bad for you. I feel bad for you. I'm with you, man. But actually, they are right. I mean, when you move a lens farther back from its effective lens position, you lose power. Right? So... Uh, so they're going to get a hyperopic uh, result. Now, this patient's power, I think, of this lens was, I think, about a 15 diopter lens. I think it was a small change, wasn't much, and he was very happy with that result. So just, you know, think about uh, ways to manage these lenses uh, in different innovations and different ways to do it. Uh, James, that's a good question. Astigmatism, it can happen, yes. This patient could develop uh, some astigmatism by steepening along the axis of the suture. Uh, in this case, he, I think maybe he got about three-quarters of a diopter, if I recall the refraction, which I should have put up here. Uh, because we're steepening uh, the vertical uh, axis here, creating some against the real astigmatism. Okay, so let's continue to move along here. Um, I, will, uh, I will maybe ask, uh, well, whose turn is it next? Valentina's turn is next, right? Okay, let's continue to go around here. So this is a persistent problem, right? And I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about this patient who has a presentation with angle closure, a bit of angle closure today here we're showing. Uh, patient presented with a clear cornea and a pressure of 50. How can you get a clear cornea with pressure of 50, Valentina? I'm not quite sure. Lucky. <laughs> lucky. Chronic. I don't like to use that word, lucky. I think chronic. chronic. Yes, chronic. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. You, if, you, if it's an acute change, oh, even going from 15 to 30, you can get uh, some edema or get some discomfort. But this is probably chronic. This is probably chronic here. And so, yes, the patient presents to us with uh, what looks like chronic angle closure. Uh, maybe has tipped over a little bit, but uh, they have 360 degrees PAS. And so they came to us like this. They were started on, uh, on medications, everything else, everything was put on. And the patient's pressure did improve. Here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the imaging here. You can see uh, there is some uh, paracentral uh, changes there in the right eye, you can see. Um, this may be related to uh, the um, macular uh, vulnerability zone that may be affected centrally, um, but overall the OCT was okay. Uh, left eye was okay there. Nevertheless, my question isn't more what we did basically because we did FACO-IOL-GSL. 
pressures ended up being 15 to 20. They were tapered out their medications. Pilocarpine was kept on for a few months because we felt that this may help prevent resynechia, and eventually it was stopped. But six months later, the patient comes back with pressures of 42 and 45 now. They have a, a deep AC that's present, you can see there, and they've got resynechia now. Okay, so now the medications are started again, and the patient's pressures are now well controlled, but they're on Diamox and everything else. So first of all, maybe my question to you, Valentina, is when if someone comes back and they've had lens surgery for angle closure, and you haven't seen the patient, but I say, Valentina, this is your patient I'm seeing in my office. You did surgery on them. You said they were doing well at three months. Now they're sitting in my chair, the pressure is 40. What things go in your mind to think, what is the mechanism by why their pressure is high right now? Right, so I mean, you can think of things pushing forward, you know, in this person, I, I certainly want to ask about the refraction of this patient. Um, and what would you be, what would you be? A myopic shift, I'm thinking, if I'm thinking malignant glaucoma, then I'm thinking this person might, may have a myopic shift. And mind you, we were looking at the biometry here and it looks like the axial length was 21 something, if I'm correct. Um, so pretty small eye. And it doesn't look like we did an iridocellular halo vitrectomy um, in this case. So certainly it's not a unicamular eye right now. I, I would think of malignant glaucoma. Okay, and what else? I mean, not, not necessarily in this case, but what else would you think about as far as why the patient has a high pressure? Well, this person can have glaucoma, you know, a certain component of um, of um, primary glaucoma. Um, um, and what do you mean by that? Just that the trabecular, trabecular mesh was dysfunction. And what do we call that when someone has had angle closure with high pressure and they have persistent pressure after surgery oh, despite right. the angle being open? So that would be called combined mechanism. Combined mechanism. So combined mechanism is another one. And related to that, what else could be going on in the early postoperative period that could be causing the pressure to go up? Inflammation causing more peripheral anterior syndicate. Inflammation can cause the open angle mechanisms of elevated pressure and, of course, can, can lead to angle closure, yes. And what about the steroids that are being used? Oh, yeah. Well, it's six months later. Well, no, I meant my, gen my, gen my general about? question was more just in terms of post-operative. Oh, gotcha. Pressure. Okay. Yeah, so it's certainly when you're post-operative, you're thinking about a steroid response as well. Yeah. Now, in this case, you can see that the, that the AC is deep. Could this be malignant glaucoma? Less likely. Okay. Uh, the Iowa is sitting pretty far back. You can see that. So it's, I would say that it's, uh, it's it, I think we can rule it out, to be honest. But I agree that maybe some subtle movement of the lens forward, it could be. Um, someone mentioned about choroidals. Very good point. So don't just think about malignant glaucoma. Think about effusions as well that can cause shallowing of the chamber. Uh, as Valentina said, anything that causes positive pressure or posterior pressure can do that. Um, choroidals, effusions, annular ciliary effusions can do this. And also, um, if we were suspecting of malignant glaucoma, we would not use pilocarpine. So, like, uh, yeah, this would. We would many, many people use pilocarpine despite the fact that malignant glaucoma, though. But you're right. We hopefully don't want to use it if, it's, if we're concerned about it. So, what, what else? What else, What is going on here? What do you think is going on here, uh, Valentina? What's your diagnosis in this case? Um, yeah. So it looks deep AC uh, lens is sitting pretty far, so less likely malignant glaucoma. I am thinking in this case that it could be a combined mechanism, glaucoma. Okay, now there's a little hint in the third bullet. He's got PAS 360 degrees around now. So could this, would it be combined mechanism if they have 360 degrees PAS? No, because it's still closed. Exactly, persistent yeah. closure. Right, so still uh, have closure, yeah. Yeah, and, and someone asked about why pilocarpine. Uh, well, you know, pilocarpine can be used. When do we use pilocarpine as effective in angle closure? Typically, when you're having um, forming peripheral anterior syndicate, you want to use pilocarpine in order to get rid of that and constrict the pupil. It can help as long as it's not what Tissy said, as long as, not, as long as it's not malignant glaucoma causing the syndicate formation, because yeah. then it could make it worse. Um, and I think we have some really good differentials too, Garth and David, at the same time, they must be working together. Uh, new vascularization, sure. This person could have N ND in the angle causing sinica formation. Maybe this patient has some other weird entity of proliferative uh, endothelialization of the angle possibly. But you can see on this picture on the top here, top left, I'm pointing with my arrow, you can see the sinica in the angle again. Look at that re reflected area there. You can see it kind of coming up into the angle here. The UBM gives you some clues though in terms of why this patient, why does the patient, despite having a, a lensectomy, and is supposed to cure glaucoma or cure angle closure. Why does this patient still have um, 
the uh, the uh, angle closure and recent Nikia here. So inflammation could be one. I mean, they could have just a lot of inflammation after surgery, and then they ended up having a Sinica formation. But remember, three months before that, uh, they were pretty good. The angles were open, pressures were good. But now they reformed it. So I think, Valentin, maybe look at the uh, ciliary process. Yes. Okay, Ella, what are you thinking here? You try, you're, trying, you're, trying to, you're trying to regain your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your answer <laughs> yes. from before. I mean, uh, I'm looking at the cellular process, it looks to me and the UBM as fairly large that what we expect in a normal patient. And I'm looking at the iris contour and it looks like it has this tenting or like there is a curvature at the base. So I'm wondering if the CP is actually pushing the iris root anteriorly and might have been causing trabecular contact for quite a while and then you had your synechia happening. Yeah, and, and, and the pilocarpine was stopped. Pilocarpine is effective in plateau iris. That's what I was getting at, right? Someone was asking, why use, why use pilo? Well, it can help to prevent that iris from gathering in the periphery when you have a high iris insertion. So that's why it was used. We felt the lensectomy is done. We should resolve it. And that's why the important point is lensectomy doesn't always solve the problem. And I think there's a lot of great comments in here. Could this be medication-induced soy body rotation? Great point. Remember the difference between an anterior ciliary body insertion versus a ciliary body rotation. Please don't use the word rotation when it's plateau. They're not rotated. They're just juxtaposition anteriorly versus medication-induced swelling of the ciliary body or an annular ciliary effusion where you have the, literally the ciliary body is swollen and basically is, is rotated up. It's a different scenario. It's rare, but of course, we know Topamax, other sulfonamides, other drugs can do that as well. So that's what uh, is likely suspected. Uh, I know that there's a question about whether there's an effusion present here, but I think that's more artifact. Uh, and it's a good point, though. Look for, look for that uh, potential for, for a supercellular effusion. Um, and by the way, and by the way, if we have a supercellular effusion, by the way, one other hint before I forget, we would see the lens move forward. This is an important point, right? If this was an effusion or rotation of the cellular body and it's fluid there, that lens will not be sitting farther back. That lens will move forward as well. And it's not moved forward. Of course, imaging has helped us to know this as well. So great, great point. Now I want to I want to go to Dima now and George, and tell me though you got a situation. Pressures are fine now, but you know of course you can observe. It's an option. But uh, what would you suggest here? What would be your what would be your your plan? I just wanted to bring a point that this is actually bilateral. So the diagnoses of anterior pulling mechanisms like uh, neovascularization. Um, fibrosis, everything like that is less likely in these cases, just to, even if it's a deep AC. Um, so in terms of this case, you need, you need the, to pull the iris towards the, uh, towards the pupil. And I think what uh, Tiziana had talked about earlier in, in terms of doing the um, pupiloplasty that's more um, towards the pupil can help in, this, uh, in these cases to bring out the iris. Yeah, and if we didn't, if we didn't do this, what else could we do, George? I mean, I, mean, I, I know that some would, may argue, why not do a a filtering procedure or why not do a mix procedure here? What about mix? Why not do a goniotomy or KDB or Omni that someone mentioned? So um, I'm a little bit uh, cautious. There's a sneaky, by the way. Yeah, we can see those all, all over 360. So yeah, I'm a little bit more cautious with cutting procedures uh, and the risk of PAS uh, reforming because of the inflammation and the heme that, kind of, that happens. So PAS may just reform in those areas. I agree. You know, I, I, I am not a big fan of, and even eye stents can sometimes get occluded there, right? And so I, I'm not a big fan of that. So here's the first thing we're going to do. We, got to, we have to first release the Sinechia. So uh, I'm going to go to the OR anyways. Otherwise, of course, you know, I do it at the salt lamp, my favorite thing to do. Uh, but we're going to go to the OR anyways, because simply releasing Sinechia isn't going to be enough. This is going to reaccumulate if we don't address it. And I think to me, there are two options. And I actually ended up doing one in each eye. In this eye, we ended up doing a mid-peripheral iris or clodge, as Tiziana mentioned earlier. Um, and the other option, though, what's the other option, though? What, what else could we do? Pilo. Anybody? Pardon? Can you leave them on pilo? Yeah, leave them on pilo? You can leave them on pilo, but the patient's got sinica here. Eddie. Eventually, they're going to have a problem. They're in diamox, too. But yes, that would be an option for sure. Leave them on chronic pilo before they got sinica. Yeah. Um, and here you can see we're, not, we're, we're taking multiple bigger bites in the mid-peripheral of the iris to basically cause some peripheral contraction without affecting the central pupil. Um, like he's had a little bit of iridoplasty done like just by laser as well there. Yeah, so we could have done that. You're right, we could have done the synechia lysis because I mean, iridoplasty alone is unlikely to release the synechia, right? Yeah. 
you know, but you could do the mechanical release and then put them on pilo post-op mm -hmm. and then do an neuroplasty post-operative week two, week three, possibly. We could do endocycloplasty in the OR, right? We could, do, we could do laser to the cellular processes and bring them back. We could use a, uh, a uh, George, I think we, we, we did it together, a cautery. Remember that we used a, uh, want to explain what we did for that? Yeah, you can use the 23 gauge uh, cautery at the uh, periphery of the iris to just pull, pull it down low temp with a, with a ramp up of the uh, cautery uh, power. And you can just go and hit the periphery and kind of shrink it back. That, that can be quite helpful. I, I think here, uh, uh, endo, endocyclophotoplasty would have been uh, helpful to shrink those processes a little bit. But again, you'd have to dilate the eye. And anyway, you can try to sneak in with your, um, with your probe uh, underneath to bring those irises, those uh, processes down. Yes, exactly. ECPL, as, as I've described it many years ago, um, and endocycloplasty could be done. In this case, and we did that in the fellow eye, actually. And, and we did also some, as you mentioned, uh, using um, an endodiathermy 23-25 gauge to, to, to cauterize the uh, peripheral iris. So what I'm doing basically using this CIF4 needle tenoproline, tenoproline, like I would for cerclage, but basically taking these bites, this is more of a basting suture in and out, in and out like this, like a sine wave, and go all the way around, maybe only two bites per quadrant, I don't need, I don't need a lot. I'll come all the way around, and then we'll tie the suture outside the eye, and I'm gonna tie fit the tension to get what I think subjectively is enough uh, contracture in the periphery. You can see the iris coming to the center here. Pulling again with both hands, you can see how the iris comes to the center. And now you basically have created this peripheral tension. We'll lock it in there. And here's the patient postoperatively. You can see the sutures present there. And the UBM really nicely shows how much that iris is on tension. Um, and uh, the central pupil can still function though. And not only does it add uh, does it pull the iris away? It actually causes stretching in the trabecular meshwork. This is actually an effective treatment for open angle glaucoma, actually, I believe, because it causes a pilot like effect in some ways uh, to create the uh, pulling on the angle. The patient did really well, actually, really well uh, in both eyes with, with either technique. I didn't feel I knew argon aerodoplasty, yes, can be, can be done, as Ahmed asked, but without releasing the sneaky, it's not going to help. So, unless we do it after sneaky lysis, that can be done. So, Yes, I think those are those are great options as well. Okay, so should we move along uh, with another case? For the, with that case, like this patient had some central visual field defect that you had noted. Um, would you, in addition to doing all that, opening up his angle, make sure it doesn't come back again? Um, I know this case, he ended up being like without any drops or medications, but would you end up doing like some, an eye stent as well or um, other? I think it'd be a great idea. I mean, I think it's low risk and you're in there already and you can put a couple of stents in there. It may help you if they've got, if, you, if the patient has some combined mechanism. Yeah. And he could because you know what? He's had this appositional closure chronically before presentation to us. Yeah. You see Nikia formation. There's a high chance he's got TM dysfunction or histopathological growth of fibrosis into that angle. So that certainly could be helpful. Okay, let's move along here. So we keep, keep on going here. This is a, a really cool case because this patient was my only patient who was actually operated by Harold Ridley. Now, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here, but maybe my fellows can answer who, who was Harold Ridley? Sir Harold Ridley now. Didn't he make the first move? Okay. Dima, you're not my lens, you're not my fellow anymore. Oh, sorry. Who was Harold Ridley? Yeah, the, the first IOL. Yes. And 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 how did he come up with the idea for the first lens? He saw the soldiers like they were not having any inflammation when um I think glass was getting in their eye. Was it? Or PMA. PMA, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could call them soldiers, but fighter pilots who were in, you know, the RAF fighters in, in, uh, in, in, in the war uh, who basically got shrapnel from the canopy, which was made of PMA, into the eye, and it was inert, and it was, uh, it was quiet. And so what a brilliant idea to use that material to basically create an artificial implant. Anyway, this patient actually was referred to me for cataract surgery. He had both thalamus, left cataract, had glaucoma surgery in 1950 when he was six months old. And I was, I was just thrilled. Uh, to see this. I mean, it was incredible. What, what a great, what a great, uh, what a genius. And by the way, he was shunned. He was shunned from the ophthalmology societies around the world for many, many years. And it was basically an outcast and he was, uh, you know, pushed out and what a tough story. Uh, finally, I think he got some recognition and of course he got knighted. Okay. So I think it's going to be uh, Tissy with, for this one. Yeah. This is a big eye Tissy. Okay. Mm -hmm. 14.5 millimeter white to white. What is a normal average adult white to white? Mm, 
it's around like a, a 12, 11.5. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. The average there, 11.754. Exactly. 11.7 is good. Uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that's kind of average, of course. And yes, I mean, there's a range of absolutely, but this is a pretty big eye here. Um, I, want to, I want you to start thinking about how we're going to manage this case in a cataract surgery. You can see this is a, I won't swear here, but this is a mofo AC death, man. Look at this 4.48 millimeters. This is not a pseudophagic eye, massive AC, right? You know, you could fill all my fellows from my history of my uh, fellowship here in this eye here. This is the um, summary here, just to let you know, 25.87 millimeter axial length. Maybe it surprises you that despite having a huge anterior segment, this axial length is not that big, relatively speaking. It's longer than the average eye, yes. Ks are flat. AC depth is, uh, is about 4.5, like I mentioned, and a big white to white, okay? So I need to think about this case in terms of what's my surgical plan and also what I'm gonna do for my IOL calculation. And I don't think um, this would be something that uh, would be, of course, a simple problem, but there are multiple issues on this. Let's look at the biometry for a second here, okay? So first of all, when we have, let me ask a general question to anyone who can answer this one. When you have someone with flat Ks, someone with flat Ks, what are most formulas gonna predict the lens is gonna sit? More anterior or more posterior to an eye that had average Ks? It's an ELP question. And the bag size is, 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 is big. It's a big bag, uh, Ali. You're, you're going to get a hyperopic shift, like a hyper, um, hyperopic um, miscalculation, I think. Because like when you think so, about LASIK, if you, do, if you do flattening of the case of the LASIK, the calculations are going to give you more. You're, 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 end up you're right. Shift. You're right. And the reason why is because, as David and Riaz mentioned, uh, that you're basically going to basically presume the lens is going to sit more anteriorly, right? It's going to say, my ELP in this patient is going to be sitting more anteriorly relative to the cornea. And therefore, I'm going to knock off power off that lens. I'm going to reduce power from that lens, right? Think of like an AC lens. AC lenses are always lower power than a PCI well because it's sitting more closer to the cornea. That's a more extreme example. And so, yes, the formulas are generally going to think, especially the older formulas, they're going to sit more anteriorly. So that's going to basically potentially create a hyperopic surprise. What about the issues around this massive AC depth here? I, I think it's the opposite that, that when we see the RAM-like eyes, you know, where, where you have a, a myopic surprise, so I also think it's going to be a hyperopic. So when you, ha when, you have a really, when you have a really, really deep AC, right, and you don't account for that deep AC, then what is going to be the potential error? Now, and I will mention, of course, that yes, it's true. Some of the more modern generation formulas that take into account multiple variables like AC depth and less thickness reduce some of these issues. Uh, and LASIK is a more extreme example where, where it doesn't, but yes, they do help to account for flat Ks and, and, and shallow chambers and, and big chambers. So having a very deep eye, the concern here is going to be what? Hyperopic surprise or a myopic surprise? Hyperopic. Yes. Yeah. So we have a couple of concerns here for this patient. So what are we going to do though, uh, getting back to uh, the, the, uh, the surgical case in terms of the surgical plan? So what Anything we're going to do different during surgery, and what are we going to do as far as our IOL calculation? And again, this is just again a nice gall strand eye just to talk about ELP and help you know and understand the relative positioning from the cornea, which will reflect, of course, the ultimate power delivered to the eye. So who's who's up to bat? I think it's Tissy, if I recall, right? So what are you going to do, Tissy? What are you going to do in this case? So what's the diagnosis, by the way? What would be the diagnosis in this case? Like, uh, for sure, like, uh, you mean uh, the glaucoma diagnosis? Because uh, uh, that's a good well, question. I didn't, I didn't mention anything. I didn't mention about glaucoma. It's had glaucoma surgery, but I didn't mention anything about glaucoma. There's no glaucoma here at this point. Okay. Look at the chat group. You got good help. You, got, you can call a friend. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is this is not quite the same, perhaps, because this patient's had congenital glaucoma before. It's kind of like a bophthalmic situation, but you can consider it in some ways a megalocornea um, and or anterior megalophthalmus. Technically, that's kind of a, an autosomal dominant um, uh, condition where you have a large anterior segment. In this case, you know, it's, it is relatively a larger anterior segment, but whether it's from a, 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 a 
genetic cause or whether it's just basically from the high IOP as a kid. Uh, either way, um, this patient basically has a very big cornea and a big anterior segment compared to the rest of the eye. So what are we going to do for this case? That's a diagnosis. What are we going to do for this case? What, what, what are the, so we talked about the eye well problem. So let's talk, let's start there. So what, are we, what, what formula are we going to use and are we going to make any adjustments? It's always the same questions we ask for any patient we're doing eye well calculations for. Yeah, I think uh, we're expecting that this patient would have like a hyperopic like surprise. So I think we have to aim a little bit more myopic when we are choosing like the eye well power and everything. We, I think we should try to to I'm a little bit myopic, expecting that the hyperopic surprise would happen. So this is one thing that I would um, consider. Yeah, I think this one. Thing so what are you going to aim for here? What what formula would you use? I would use Barrett. A Barrett, yeah, Barrett Universal Tools. Always, always a good answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the problem yeah. is the, the problem is of course that that there's really no formula that has validation in these really crazy eyes, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, using the Barrett TK is a good idea. And by the way, someone asked the question, why does a deep AC can create a hyperopic surprise? Well, it's a deep AC combined with a relatively average length of an eye, right? If you have a huge eye length and a huge deep AC, well, they're kind of related. But if you have a relatively shorter eye for a very deep AC, which this is the case, that can result potentially in an error. Although, again, as, as we talked before, yes, Barrett Universal 2 Olson formulas, those do help. Uh, to account for these uh, these changes and these differences. So, yeah, I'll just say that uh, Hill RBF uh, maybe not now at the level that uh, with the number of, of eyes that they've uh, that they put into the formula, but that would be an interesting formula to at least run to see what they would uh, offer as well because these uh, kind of AI based formulas are uh, are are probably the next uh, generation to help out with these more uh, out of range eyes. Yeah, of course, but, the, but the, you need data for that, right? So it's all out of bounds. I think it's a good idea to get multiple, you know, formulas, like put in your, your, your uh, measurements into multiple formulas and, and kind of get an average feel of what you, you'd go for rather than just take one. Okay, good. And what, what would you aim for here, Dima? I would aim for more uh, myopic. George, anything, on, anything to add on that? Yeah, I would also add, uh, aim a little myopic, probably minus one and a half, one. Yeah, we ended up doing that. You're right. I mean, we we uh, did that because he also was was thinking about doing a bit of mini monovision as well. So it was kind of a bonus, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was great. What about the surgical plan? Anything specific on the surgical plan that that we'd be we'd be thinking about, or just going to be routine FACO? So that's the other thing I was going to say. When you're talking about these cases, you know that the zonules are going to be loose, so you want to take that into consideration a little bit too in terms of your calculations. Good point. Really good point. I think zonular weakness is associated with a couple things: megalophthalmus associated with congenital glaucoma, absolutely valid. CTR use is good. A new, whoa, look who's here, a new, Andia, nice. And especially like previous glaucoma surgery, you can have like a zonular weakness uh, for patients that had previous glaucoma surgery. Because during the surgery, you can have the compression of the anterior chamber, those kind of things. And uh, Spe Especially a uh, trabeculectomy or tube. This patient had a goniotomy done, congenital oh, done, so yeah. maybe less, but you're, very good point. I think people don't think about this, but anybody who's had a trab or a tube or a bleb procedure, you got to think about future uh, zonular weakness when they have cataract done because you're right, the chamber may have shallowed or intraoperally or postoperally, I should say. Anything else on surgical plan? What, what, what's going to be the what's going to be the big issue here? I think in this patient, intraoperatively and also postoperatively. So th these these eyes are, are really uh, difficult eyes. They're really deep. Uh, you're like you're operating in a hole. You might have zonular weakness from the get go. So, so Ike, this is one of the rare times that I've already done a, a megalocornea eye. Was, they were kind of waiting for me post fellowship, and uh, it was a, a six and a half uh, millimeter anterior chamber depth. And these are really challenging because you're going deep, deep, deep in there, and the subluxed lens. Uh, there's a lot of potential issues. So, keeping the rexus as you did here, kind of smaller, because it, it it looks big, but it's actually five millimeters. This is something that you have to keep in mind and when you're doing it. It's not as uh, as a normal rexus, it's a, it's, it's a larger eye, so you have to think that it, it's right. smaller compared to the rest. Just, well, just stop you for a second. You're absolutely right. Just one step before, these patients may have thin corneas, right? And you make your, your clear corneal incision, and you go, whoa, that's such a short incision because you didn't account for the fact they got a thin cornea. So if you have OCT like we have, great. But error on the side of making a bit longer incision, you can always pull back before you enter the AC. 
I would be very careful with that because you can enter very short and have a thin, thin, difficult to close incision as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. We, we do capsular rexus based on our muscle memory. We think of the pupil and the limbus and we do it. Um, the rexus is not gonna run out, I don't think, but it could be big because mentally you think you're trying to use the pupil as a guide. These, these uh, etched forceps can give us a five and a half millimeter rexus, which we absolutely wanna do here. Why is this so important? I mean, we always want a good rexus size, but why in this case is it so important to get a good rexus here? Round, circular, centered. This one isn't bad. So we already know that uh, we might be having some uh, refractive instability because of the effective lens position. We don't want to add more factors like uh, having a bigger rexes and then you would have the IOL uh, not staying in place. So I guess this is one thing. I just want to point out as well, don't forget these patients, someone mentioned earlier, these patients will have lens, iris, diaphragm, retropulsion syndrome. Who knows what that is and why does it happen? And you can see it happening here. Look at the iris fluttering. What is it, guys? Fellows? Got a highly myopic eye. In another case, let's say high myopic eye. What happens with the AC when you go in with your infusion? It goes posteriorly. Why? You got a very, you got a wool. It's like you're operating on the macula, right? Because the lens is sitting so far back. Why does it happen? Reverse pupil block. Yes, yeah. and, and you get this retropulsion because you have no aqueous going behind it. Normally in FACO, you get aqueous going kind of front and behind, right? Uh, but here you get this basically snap back effect of the iris onto the back, onto the anterior capsule. And so you get yeah. a very deep, you see, how do you, how do you, how do you address that? How do you, how do you try to address that if you see it? Just by lifting on the iris. Yeah, good, okay. Yeah. Uh, good, okay, so we have this done. Uh, keeping the chamber formed, as long as we're in bad, we are gonna put a CTR in uh, just to be on the safe side. I think it helps. Uh, in case we've got weak zonias. But here's what I'm going to do is, here's the problem, guys. We've got a big bag here. If I put the lens in the capsular bag, that lens is going to be at risk for actually be subluxing in the bag. The bag's centered, right? But it's massive. And this lens, which is typically a 13, 12 and a half millimeter length lens, doesn't properly fit in that bag and it ends up subluxing. So first of all, I'm not going to use a one piece. I'm using a three piece here, number one. The second, I'm going to capture the reverse optic capture, or you can do regular optic capture reverse optic capture here because then we have it well centered. I, I have a number of cases that I've seen over the years, patients refer to me where the eye was sublux, not because it's on the weakness, but because the bag is huge and these lenses are not designed for massive bags. So now we have a reverse optic capture. I think it's nice because it keeps the haptics away from the sulcus and it keeps the eye well centered in, in the, in the, in the capsule rexus. So that's basically an option you can have there. You can see the positioning of the lens. You can see how deep the AC is. And the patient actually ended up being actually minus one plus one despite the fact we aim for minus one and a half, George, right? So look at that, look at that, what happened after this case. So a lot of considerations with these eyes. Don't forget these have big bags. Don't forget the fact that they can end up being subluxed in the bag, which I think was mentioned. So really good uh, points that are mentioned. The chat group is just hopping, man. You guys are hot out there. And by the way, when you guys are writing, make sure you write to all panelists and attendees so they can see your answers. Otherwise you only write to the panelists and we, don't, we only see the answers and it's nice for your colleagues to also see your answers that you're right because you've got great points to mention there. So let's do that. Okay, um, should we do one more case or should we finish that? What do you think? One more. We can do one more, man. We yeah. still have about 500 something people. Okay, well, we can do more. We can do five more if you want. Okay, we, I see this. everyone's saying go. Okay, go, keep on going. Okay, go. This one's called a bag and, and, and blow. A bag and blow, a bag and a blow. Uh, it's a 31 year old female who's, I think it's Allah's turn. Yep. 31 year old female airbag injury three months ago and, uh, airbags save lives, but man, they certainly cause eye trauma and the pressure is really low. Uh, the visions come fingers and there is basically what we see. We have multiple issues here in this traumatic case. We have hypotony, maculopathy from a cleft that you can see the retina is attached. Um, <laughs> some of you are predicting the case already. We have vitreous in the anterior chamber. We have an atonic dilated pupil and zonular dialysis. This is a, a classic gas case, right? Uh, this, is what, this is what you live for here during the fellowship, pre, intra, or post COVID. Uh, what's your treatment plan here, Allah? So obviously when we consult such patients, we start off with medical treatment. Uh, we would start with atropine, um, steroid eye drops, try to manage this hypotony, uh, 
medically. Uh, I would also explore in the symptoms. Um, uh, we would like to see the cataract or the lens, sorry, not necessarily cataractus, but you would also look if the zonules are stable or not, uh, if there is any uh, zonular dialysis. Obviously, this patient has one. It looks like it has a tonic pupil. It looks like this patient is all set up for more of a surgical intervention. So one thing I would think of is doing a uh, lens removal with IOL, um, then do uh, vitrectomy to address the uh, prolapse vitreous, uh, aridodialysis repair, which will solve the aridodialysis defect and the hypotony maculopathy, and maybe even um, uh, pupiloplasty to address the dilated atonic pupil. Yeah, you covered a lot of things. I mean, maybe let's go into a bit detail from, from Dima and George about the order of things. And, and before that, I should mention, of course, that, and, and you know, Sam Mask gave a nice talk last time about psychodialysis clefts. And, and there's you know, no question for, for many clefts we can do laser. This cleft, I should, I should have mentioned, is about almost three clock hours. And, uh, and so um, that's a consideration. I think laser can be effective in three clock hours, although I find generally in my experience not so great. Um, but uh, we, we, we are thinking, of course, surgical here. We have other things going on in this patient too, mind you. So, so George, I don't know if you want to take, take this or Dima. George, tell me what you're, what you're thinking here as far as your steps. Would you do it all, do you do it all in one surgery? Would you do it uh, you know, sequentially? If you do it in one, what, what, do you, what, your step, what steps are you going to do here? So we're just talking surgical uh, options, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think here I would, I would try to address, uh, address it all uh, at once. Um, so we have this atonic pupil which makes it a little bit uh, challenging too, because you're going to have to, if you want to try to decrease the um, pupil size, you can do a pupiloplasty. And then uh, there's on your dialysis that you have to be mindful of. You may need a capsular tension segment, capsular tension uh, ring. Um, and then the cyclodialysis cleft, uh, which you have to think about managing by uh, either an ab external approach or an ab internal approach. Um, if you're doing an ab external approach, you're basically uh, opening up basically like a trab flap, but going up to the uh, uh, supracortal space and trying to reapproximate re everything together with some big, uh, big suture bites. And um, this multiple bites can, can help uh, reposition re it. And I should mention, by the way, that this, this patient, we have, we have waited. We didn't rush in, of course, because these clefts sometimes can close. Uh, medical treatment was initiated. Uh, time was given. In fact, I remember I was flying back from Armenia. I was in I was in the Paris airport, and I was like there for like four hours. And I was walking around, and I'm, I'm like, "Oh, good, no one knows who I am here. I'm going to just hang out and walk around." And then this patient ends up being there. And it's the same patient here. And she's like, she couldn't couldn't see and everything. I'm like, "Okay, is this a pre-op or post-op patient? I hope it's a pre-op patient because if it's a post-op patient, it's bad because they can't see." And I, you know, kind of kind of asking whether this you know kind of get some information. Oh, how are you doing? Uh, you know, when, when, I don't remember when you were last in. What do you have? Do you have anything done? Right, kind of filled them out. I don't remember this case, of course. Uh, and fortunately, she was she had not had surgery. She was waiting, so I said, "Okay, oh yeah, we're going to see you soon and do it." So, we ended up doing this case. Yes, it was a, it was a good case, and we just kind of walked through a little bit here. And you mentioned things here nicely already, George. But uh, we have, of course, consideration for vitreous. And when I have this much vitreous and concern and a sublux lens, I typically make a parse plane incision. I, I we talked about it before. I think it gives us better access. Uh, and uh, we can then address vitreous by pulling it back and not just simply bringing it up into the AC. There's a large sheet of vitreous you can see over the lens and, and into the angle. And I edited this video, but it's not easy to basically uh, vitrectomize in the anterior segment when you're so close to the lens and so close to the iris. Uh, by the way, that cut in the lens was not from my vitrectomy. That was there from before. Uh, it helps to have a little irrigation cannula, as you see there, to use it as a second instrument to move tissue away. And I use that a lot to keep things away there. OVD is in the eye now, and you can see the large cleft. I always like a gonial lens. I think it's important to visualize that. And I marked this like I would a toric lens. We thought we would tackle the lens first. There's obvious temporal dialysis and, uh, and, and a tilted lens, but not a very uh, dynetic lens. It's not moving that much. But we were going to need something to support it. So these uh, MST capsule retractors are great. Um, and this really helps. And I agree, Jason. I think uh, a maintainer would have been good, too, for the vitrectomy, for sure. Irrigation in the AC even, and using a coolant hook as a second instrument for the vitrectomy part. You're absolutely right, because you can hit that lens with vitrector easily. It's nice to have these pap sort of retractors in there to support the bag, uh, and we get the FACO done quite nicely. IA done, the bag's evacuated, we remove the, uh, the, the, um, the hooks. Here we're gonna put a segment in the eye. Um, you know, this is basically where it's gonna support the, uh, the lens and the temporal quadrant. 
I'm always using Gore-Tex here, docking it with uh, a 25 gauge needle. Note that groove is made, again, about a millimeter and a half posterior to that blue zone, that white zone area behind it. Um, and this is, again, you can see farther back than two millimeters from the limbus. Uh, it's important, again, to just don't use the limbus for landmarks. I can't emphasize that enough. This is a slip knot here um, to do this. And then we're going to put a CTR in, which provides more circumferential support. So I usually combine these together. And we have a one-piece lens going in the eye. Now, um, I have not done anything for the cleft yet, but I do want to basically address the pupil while we're there. But I know that if I suture the pupil down, I could actually pull apart the cleft more. So this is kind of a bit of a, a counteractive issue here. So I'm going to first place my... Um, my, uh, my, my sutures for my uh, cyclopexy. Now I have done both internal closure using a capture tension ring in the sulcus or doing external cyclopexy. I still like doing it externally like this, a half thickness flap, cutting down here. And again, here we want to cut down just behind the blue zone, uh, but you know, maybe half a millimeter or a millimeter from the blue zone. That'll again put us basically where that iris root should be when we suture it back. Making a full thickness cut down, you're right onto the choroid. Yes, that seems a bit scary, uh, but the uh, choroid here is now engaged with the needle. It's faster, it's faster tissue, but we're working more ciliary body muscle tissue here. I should, I should mention ciliary body, not choroid here, sorry. Uh, and basically making mattress sutures here to grab the iris, attaching it to the posterior lip of the incision. So these are basically X sutures. I'm going all the way across. It's not a running suture, but they're multiple sutures. I just place them all because it's easy to place when, the, when, the, uh, when, the, when they have the the deep spiral cut fully done. And you can see you were taking multiple grafts. I think I'm gonna do probably, there's one, two, three mattress sutures already. I think uh, probably five in total. I'd like to kind of overdo it. And then we're gonna tie them. And basically it's like an X suture essentially, an X mattress um, to bring it together. So we're basically are imbricating the iris within the sclera. And it's always good to go beyond the extent of the, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, of the psychodialysis. Um, you know, if I have a cortical hemorrhage, it's a concern. Yes, I have the eye pressurized, which is important. Um, and again, I'm working on sodium body tissue, uh, and I'm working behind the major circle of, of uh, vascular vasculature, so I feel I'm okay here. But it's a it's a good concern. And now you can see I'm happy with lens position. I've sutured the sodium body tissue. We're there. We're the, always rotated the knot. Now we can do our cerclage. Being careful not to pull the iris excessively and potentially uh, cheese wire those proline sutures here. We'll then go all the way around. I won't show it in detail. This is, this is uh, tenor proline all the way around per string. We'll tie it here. And this is a pretty big case. I realize it's a big case here, but just to kind of show the extent of things we can do in the anterior segment, some fibrin glue that can be used. But most importantly, we have to address the psychodialysis cleft. And while we're there, take out the lens, manage it there. Yes, it's scary. I see some of the uh, panelists or some of the uh, attendees are saying that is true. Uh, and Jason's saying only 20 minutes at the slit lamp. Yeah, only 20 minutes, only 20 minutes in the, in the slit lamp here. Uh, there's our result. I should also mention, I didn't talk about it, but about IOL calculations, we have to adjust for it because of course the axial length is shorter than the usual when it's gonna be pressurized. When we have an eye guys, when the eye is artificially short because of hypotony, after surgery, the pressure is gonna go up now and the axial will get longer. If you don't account for that, what kind of refractive error will you get? Myopic or hyperopic? Surprise. Again, in a hypotenuse short eye. And the reverse happens in a pressure of 50 when you do a phaco trab and the axial length goes from big to slightly smaller. Man, you got, you got, the, you got the chat. Come on, guys. I can't hear you. Just to go basics, right? You got, you got a short eye, you got a, you got a high power lens, right? Short eye usually needs more power. Put the same power in a longer eye, what's going to happen? You're going to get a myopic or hyperopic myopic. surprise? Myopic. Yes. One person is hyperopic. Sorry, Ellie. But yes, myopic surprise. Correct. And the reverse happens when you do a phaco trap with someone with a high pressure. They go from a long eye to a short eye and they get hyperopic surprise. So it would, it, it would have, it, we didn't talk about it. It's a good idea to aim a little bit myopic. We ended up actually getting a bit of a hyper, hyperopia here, actually, interesting enough. Also, the keratometry is also off because you have a flat, you have you have a, a flatter cornea, right? Which becomes I point, Yeah, I guess one point as well because we place the CTS. So this is one thing that we uh, compensate for as well for my, more myopic correction. And why is that? When you have one someone with weak zonules, and you suture a segment in the eye or a ring, 
why do you why do you why do you expect a hyperopic error? So with a CTS or a zonulopathy, you tend to have more posterior effective lens position. So this is something you have to account for. Good, good. Now this patient also, let's, go, let's talk about a general case. This patient has a flat, flatter cornea than usual, right? Because they're soft, the pressure's two, yeah. right? So you put those Ks in your formula. Now after surgery, their cornea is steeper now because they're pressurized. What is the refractive surprise gonna be? Um, we should get a little bit of hyperopic shift, I guess, so. What do you think, Tissy? Valentina? Can you, can you repeat that again? Uh, okay, if you have a flat cornea, so flat because it's eyes soft and now it becomes steeper after surgery. Um, I would say maybe myopic, yeah. Oh, all the changes of mind before the, before the Latina's answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you have a flat cornea. You know, in general, you got, low, you got less corneal power, you need more power in the eye, so you're gonna, you're gonna have a high power lens, higher power lens. Now the cornea becomes steeper now, and you have the same high power lens in the eye. Myopic. So yes, good answers by the group. Okay. I, could, could you just do this like in steps, like increase his pressure and then get a better calculation maybe, and then do his FACO? I think that's a, uh, yeah, so we didn't answer that question. What would you do in this case? I think Jason had a good point. You can use a fellow eye. You could pressurize the eye with viscoelastic uh, and try to get the eye to a, a more normal pressure which can last for maybe a couple of days, which is a great idea too. I think those are good ideas. Although I would, I would expect though that the, the actual... Uh, natural uh, position of that cornea is probably not going to happen within just a couple of days, but it might be better at least. It's a really good point. No, but I mean, can you do the, the, the cleft surgery and then wait and then go back and do the fake? Oh, and... I see two steps. Yeah, yeah, you could do that as well, for sure. You could do the cleft surgery and then come back. Uh, I just felt with all the vitreous and everything else in the eye and everything else to manage it at the same time. But yes, you could do that too. Yes, good point. Okay, so uh, let's move on to maybe one more last case. Should we stop or go on? What do you guys think? Go on. Okay, oh, man, you guys want to keep on going. Wow, okay. Go. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll keep on going. One more case, though, because then we got to stop. It's Saturday, right? <laughs> what is it? What is it? What's the temperature in Toronto? It's like snowing today, right? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, okay, so this is a phakic issue. Not an aphakic issue, but a phakic issue, okay? Um, and 53-year-old male, who's next? Who's on this one? Ella? Maybe all three of us can go, actually. Oh, so. okay. All right. Threesome. All right. Okay. So this is a 53-year-old male. Sorry. And previous high myope. And this patient has had a PMA phakic artisan lens in the eye. Okay. Now presents with a cataract. I actually happen to have the, uh, find out the pre-op artisan uh, refraction minus 10, as you can see there. And now you can see... Um, the current refraction here is uh, plano minus one. Now, this refraction was immediately after the arson, not from a cataract, just so you know, although they have, have more now as well. And Jason Jones is asking me, where do I have to go? See patients? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay, this is the, um, this is the uh, IOL printout you can see here. Patient here is a 30 millimeter eye. So, you know, pretty long. This is a axial AC depth of 3.5 in the right eye and 2.8 in the left eye. Kind of puzzled why they have a shallow chamber in the left eye. Lens thickness 4.88 in the left, 4.25 in the right eye. Okay, so just take this information in right now. All three of you, you guys are taking this all in. What a team, what a team, amazing. You guys looking, looking like you're ready to go. Um, this is the keratometry. You can see this patient has a couple of diopters of width the rule cylinder present. And we also have a cornea here, which isn't bad for this 50-some-year-old patient that has phacic IOLs. So the question is, what's the surgical plan? And what are we going to do as far as IOL calculation? So who's going to go first? This is a problem when you get all three of you answering. Nobody answers then. <laughs> no, I can go. Okay, so if you go back to the biometry then, um, since this patient has an artisan lens, it will be measuring a wrong um, anterior chamber depth, as we can see here, just. So you can actually see the artisan lens in the, in the, uh, in right. the Right, so it's actually a good question that I don't know. Like, I don't know where the machine will stop measuring if you have an artisan lens placed on top of the pupil. 
Well, you can probably, you can actually tell looking at the, the scans, yes. So yes, you, you, you may have a, an AC depth that's measured artificially shallow, right? Yeah. And if you don't adjust for that, and you use a Barrett formula or something like that, what would the refractive surprise be then, potentially? Closer to the cornea, so... Pardon? Myopic. Allah, Tissi, do you agree with that? I can't hear you, Tissi. Oh, uh, hyperopic. Hyperopic, okay. Allah, the, Allah your two, your two co-fellows are <laughs> fighting with each other. They're like, about to go at it with each other here. They, they disagree with each other. What's the right answer? A hyperopic. Hyperopic. Dima, George, I need, I need to go to my ex-fellows here now to help break the, break, uh, break the, uh, the, the, the disagreement here. So I want everyone to remember this. I mean, and you guys know I reinforce this. Always think about the impact of our measurements on lens calculations. As you can see, all of us here need to do a better job to really understand IOL optics and how formulas are calculated. We don't need to go into the, the, the deep detail of how a Barrett works, but just understanding essentially the impact of cornea, axillant, AC depth, eye well position are all important to kind of figure out, you know, what the ELP is. So I think you're already having some good answers here on the chat group. You guys are so smart. Dima? I'm th hyperopic because the AC depth is going to be smaller. So George, who's right here? Final, tell me. So the, the, the predicted formula will think that the eye is more shallow, so smaller eye. So you'll end up being in a hyperopic situation, but it'll give you a myopic result. So the way to think of it is this, basically, if you have, if you have generally a shallower AC pre-op, in general, the formulas will predict that the lens is going to sit closer to the cornea. Right, so it's going to basically knock off power, reduce power, right? And so when it reduce power, basically means you have a lower power. And if in fact the AC was not that shallow, and you put that same lens in that eye, you're going to end up having a hyperopic surprise. Sorry, I should have got Jeb involved in here. Jeb, you're awfully quiet today, man. Awfully quiet, lucky guy. So yes, so that 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 is that is a consideration. So if you don't really think about it, just go ahead and just oh you you know what I'm just going to put my formula in there. Then you're going to make a mistake. Now the reality is. This is going to be a low power lens. Look at the power it's calculating, five diopters, four diopters. So the impact of being off is not going to be as great if it was a, you know, a 25 diopter lens, which is, which, is, which is true. But let's try to be as accurate as we can. So how do we, how do we address this issue? You can actually manually measure, measure sure. this yourself. Sure. Look at the printout, manually measure, do a, an answer to someone OCT. Um, you can do a lot of different things to manipulate and get and get your answer for sure you can or what's the other option if you were really want to just yeah. not worry about the AC depth and in the past we've even done things like use the SRKT which doesn't take uh, AC depth so that you actually just go with the cornea and the axial length that's another yeah thing. yeah don't use the AC depth in your calculation take it out don't put it into the bare formula right I think Amadeep I think you mentioned that somewhere great point um, you can do all these things to address it you know so just make sure you address it. Again, it's a small lens power, I, I understand, I agree. Um, what about the fact of axial lens measurements in the presence of an IOL in the eye? What impact does having an Arsene lens or a, an ICL have on the axial lens measurements? Does it have an impact on it? So I think silence means that has no effect, so you're right. It has, it, you know, I've seen a few studies. It may have a small negligible effect uh, and it may measure a little bit shorter, but it's minuscule here. And so, yeah, we don't typically um, address the fact that it's uh, gonna alter the axial. Okay, so we have all that done. So we're gonna calculate your eye well calculations with hopefully a more accurate AC depth or you're not gonna put it in. What formula are you gonna use, guys? Barrett. Barrett, fine. SRKT does well in long eyes, right? The problem in these long eyes isn't so much isn't so much related to the ELP. It's more related to the getting a good axial length measurement as opposed to uh, in, a, in a small eye because, of course, the lens powers are so small. So, yeah, that could be all be used. Okay. But let's talk about the surgical plan. Sorry? 
The other thing also in the, in the axial length is it could be cephalomas as well. So you got to take that into to watch out for that as well. Great, valuable point. And I think autobiometry can help to address that, but absolutely true. Absolutely true. I would add one point as well. If you look at the total K, uh, you could tell that the uh, patient has astigmatism as well. So I guess when considering an IOL, you would consider toric options as well. Okay. Especially that against the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this, this is going to be also impacted by a surgical plan, right? Because we have a PMA lens in there. Yes. That lens is, uh, you know, almost six millimeters in length, in, in width, sorry, in width, eight and a half in length on average. So that can impact, of course. Why, 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 why is that important to consider when we think about a toric lens here? We can rotate. Uh, no, I'm talking specifically about the arson no. lens. You have an arson lens in the eye. You got to take it out. How could that impact the astigmatism or the toric lens you're going to choose? Because of the incision, that uh, the the uh, the incision to remove yeah, and the absolutely. arson lens is like six millimeters. There's that no way to get it out. Out. six millimeter incision, guys. Yeah. And that's going to definitely induce the astigmatism, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's going to be an important concern. It's true a toric lens may have a higher sense of rotating in a highly myopic eye, but that that's an independent issue, right? I'm talking about the arson lens. So yes, that's a problem. So considering all this, would you do, would you do the toric lens here? I, I would say in this case, yeah, I, I wouldn't use a toric. Maybe uh, address it with other uh, treatment options. Let's say contact lenses, post-op spectacles, or even laser vision correction post-op. If it's like uh, visually significant, really bothers some stigmatism, but I, I wouldn't expect it to be this way. So. Martin Spencer, who's a, who's, a, who's a pro at this stuff, has talked about a frown incision in the sclera to induce no astigmatism. Uh, that's pretty incredible, no astigmatism for a six millimeter frown. I think I've heard that as well. And I think probably you, you're, you guys are pretty crafty at it. I, I find I still get some astigmatism, but yes, I think a frown incision would be good. But what about use it to your advantage? Why not make a, a superior scleral incision and expect to have some, some, some flattening superiorly? Right? I mean, I think as, as uh, Gerardo said, remove the artisan along the steeper, steeper uh, meridian, right? So that could be an option. Okay, so what are we gonna do surgically? Because we've got this big lens in the AC, what are we gonna do? And Ravi, no, I'm not gonna tell you who my favorite fellow is, because I don't have a favorite fellow. I think, I think this case, it was a, a baby boss case, right? Uh, no. No? Okay, but I've seen like a case like similar like that. The Japanese. Oh yeah, we've had we've had we've had quite a few cases like that. We've had quite a few cases like this. Like yes. this yes. Beautiful yes. case uh, that we. By the way, do you want do you want to explain what baby boss means? Because that sounds kind of uh, some people are wondering what does that mean exactly. Baby boss is jab. <laughs> is jab jab? You're the baby boss. Look at that. <laughs> right. Tissiani has many bosses, by the way. Apparently, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so like I would consider to to perform the FACO with the with, with the artisan in the eye. Like I would perform the FACO and just after that I would uh, explain the artisan. And the reason why I would do this is uh, because we wouldn't need to to place the the big incision like a like a like a before FACO. So we would have a more stable AC. And where so where are your incisions? Um, I would place my, my incision, uh, I would try to do superior here, like uh, at, uh, like 12. And a corneal incision or a scleral incision? A corneal incision. And then you enlarge it six millimeters to put it, take the artisan out? Yeah, I would do like a, like a, like a cornea, uh, groove first. And then I would do like a, uh, like a 2.2 incisions to do the FACO. And then after that, I would enlarge to remove the artisan lens. George, uh, Dima, any thoughts on, on your thoughts about the surgical plan here? I think I would just do a regular uh, temporal incision, 2.2, minimal astigmatism caused by the 2.2 millimeter incision. You unclip one of the sides of the artisan. You go ahead and do your FACO underneath. And uh, then if you want to remove it and address that astigmatism, then you can go through a superior incision and remove it and then suture that one down. Um, you so can here, you can see, here you can see that the artisan was actually placed to six and 12. And so we could actually deenclavate one side and move it to the side to get access, which helps us. So we deenclavated and then actually moved it over uh, and uh, placed it more nasally. So it's actually, actually, I mean, Jeb, you did a case uh, this year where you did the same thing. 
And, uh, and so in this case, we actually are going to re enclavate the, uh, the artist and see how we're putting it back on the iris. It doesn't bounce around the anterior chamber. By the way, Riaz, I don't think you can cut a PMA artisan. Tell me how you cut an art artisan PMA. There are Artiflex lens, which is a, which is a foldable uh, artisan, which is different, but this is a PMA. Um, so we're basically faking underneath it. In fact, anything, this is kind of like, a, like an endothelial shield, right? I mean, protecting endothelium even. And I like to keep the chamber formed. Don't let the chamber shallow because it could hit the lens and the, and the endothelium. Working underneath it works out quite well. And in this case, we did not use a toric lens, putting the eye well in the bag. And we're working through a temporal 2.2 millimeter clear corneal incision, which again, we know creates a small amount of astigmatism typically. Uh, now we're gonna de-enclavate the uh, artisan. It helps us to have a little Sinsky hook while holding it with microinstruments. And we'll do both sides. And then I think as, as George said, I think this is a good, a good time to think about making an incision that's you know, not on the cornea, especially in this case here. We're gonna go farther back. Uh, could, have done, could have done a, re a reverse frown, but in this case, I actually wanted to um, create a bit of flattening effect to treat the astigmatism here. That was the, that was the thought anyways. Um, and so essentially you can see the, uh, the section made into, into the cornea uh, through this uh, flap. And basically we'll explant it from there. And so you can see that um, you have the uh, lens pulled out. And of course, at this point in time, now there's no more phaco to be done. So we don't have to worry about leakage. I could have done it at the beginning of the case, but even with a spiral tunnel, there still can be leakage and instability of that lens that may occur. And so that's basically, again, one way to manage these cases. They're not often. And yes, if it's a foldable lens, uh, a foldable artisan lens, and so that you can cut it and remove it. But even then, you still got to make a larger incision than 2.2, which is a bit of a drag and a bit, bit of a pain. Um, so that's basically the way to think about it. So that's basically one way to think and measure it here. Some people are saying you can just do the fake oak superiorly, just do a 2.2 superiorly and then enlarge it, uh, move the artisan and then enlarge it to take it out after. Yeah, this was my initial plan. I was thinking, wondering why this would not like be more simple. To work superiorly? Yes. Yeah. Well, then, then base, first of all, you're going to be working through a slit tunnel incision. Unless, yeah. unless you want to make a corneal like, incision. Yeah, I was, I was cataract to, uh, retina cases. Yeah, corneal. Incision. When they do the combo cataract of thick of its, sometimes they do it like superiorly and they do a scleral tunnel and then, re then operate and re remove the cataract. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, you're right. That could be done 100%. But I just think the ergonomics of working superiorly, um, I think, are, are not, not ideal, not great. And a deep set eye and everything else could make it complicated. And then I have an arson lens in the eye too working underneath, right? And don't forget, this artisan lens was position six and 12. Yeah. So for sure I have to, de I, de I, de I move this anyways, I guess you could argue, but this was just simpler to do that. So yeah, it could be done that way too. There was just a question that comes up about what happens with it when you have a fake lens in the eye. Uh, in this case, this was a series of patients at artisan and Artiflex. You can see that measurements by ILO Master were significantly longer, they said, than preoperative measurements, 0.12. Uh, and so that's what this found. I, I, I don't know if that's, you know, absolutely a big concern for me. Um, but it is something just to consider um, when we think about it. Uh, and as you said before, I generally don't really take into account, to be honest with you. Again, going back to this question, if the patient did have a longer ILO master measurement that was done after and before, what is the impact on the refraction? So you measured the eye before, before surgery. And it was shorter than what it ended up being after because of the artifact in the lens, if it's true. What is the refractive result we're going to get? <laughs> Jason's already jumping on this one already. You guys are fast. Come on, fellas. You got to be faster than the attendees. What's going to be the answer here? Myopic. Okay, one for one vote for myopic. What's the next vote going to be? Myopic. Okay, why? And don't say, don't say because Jason Jones said it. I know he's a smart guy. Jason Jones, by the way, was a, co was a resident when I was a fellow at the Marin Institute. We had an absolutely fantastic year. Jason is, a, is an amazing surgeon, a great thinker. He's a surgeon surgeon. This guy thinks like ergonomically, watch his videos on YouTube. Um, he's, uh, he's a genius. We've got to have you on here sometime, Jason. Why, guys? Come on, this shouldn't be hard. We still have 10 minutes left. I can wait 10 minutes for the answer. 
And those of you, by the way, who think I'm mean, this is not mean. This is basically just, hey, listen, let's kind of learn this stuff. And the best way to learn is to, is to, is to think through it. Does it have to do with the axial length maybe being overestimated? Or? It's a simple question. I mean, if you measure your eye and I measure it falsely being short, right? But in fact, it's longer than I measure it. What's going to be the result? What's the, what is, what's the answer? Tell the world. Yeah. Could be myopic then. Yeah. Could be. Yep. Is, it is myopic. Yeah. If I, it, Tissian, if your axial is 24 millimeters, let's say, but I, I made a mistake and I, and I, and I thought it's 21 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Am I going to put a higher power lens or a lower power lens in your eye? High, uh, high power lens. Okay, I put it in your eye now. I put, I, put, I put it in your eye now, right? And and then, but you actually are twenty-four millimeters. What's gonna happen? What's gonna be your, your refraction? Myopic. Yes. I'm more myopic. Yes. So that's that's the answer, right? It's, it's yeah. gonna be overpowered for your eyes. So just you know, think think it through, guys. Think it through. It's it's, it's, it's optics. Uh, this patient ended up being 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 all right. A little bit a little bit uh, myopic, you can see there, but reasonably reasonably uh, there. And uh, that's basically our result. This is. Uh, a sunrise. I've been I've been having more time to wake up in the morning and and take my time waking up and looking at my window and I get drawn out to the uh, to the to the lake to take pictures um, of sunrises. It's it's amazing. I'm all alone. It's all quiet. I'm looking around me. Someone watching me. I'm a little paranoid. And uh, so that's basically the uh, the case. So thanks everybody. I mean we can take some any 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 thoughts as we end this. Uh, George, Dima, our fellows, Ala, Valentina, Tissi, I thought you guys did great, great job, fantastic. This is, these are not simple cases. You guys were great uh, teammates working together or sometimes fighting with each other, but that's okay. Controversy is good as well. Um, and uh, I thought you guys did really, really well. And you guys shared great knowledge and you, and you talked through it, which is what people want to hear about, which is great. So thank you for doing that. George, Dima, our former fellows. Yeah, great cases. Yeah, the two great cases. These are really a lot of key uh, teaching pearls. And I just want to you know, go back to the megalocornea eyes. These are really rare. You're not going to see these uh, coming up in your uh, clinics uh, every day. But when they do come, be cautious, be, be afraid, and pre you know, be prepared. Have extra lenses available if you need them, uh, three-piece lenses, uh, if you need even an anterior chamber lens available for the, uh, the time of surgery, these can be uh, quite challenging cases. Uh, most of these were quite challenging to be quite honest, but uh, you know, you have to always have a, a plan and then a backup plan always. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's quite, quite true. Quite true. Always have a backup plan, plan A, plan B, plan C. I mean, so much, so much of this is, is, is a mental game. It's, it's our, it's our ability to, uh, to, to have the knowledge, but know where to access the knowledge and then know how to apply it. And as you, as you've seen here, um, some of it is, is really basic stuff. Some of it is stuff that I hope every cataract eye well surgeon understands. We run a course for our residents uh, every year. Um, and, uh, and that covers a lot of the basic optics of eye well calculations. I am, I am not an optics expert. I'm not a physics expert. Uh, but uh, I try to make sure I understand these concepts, what happens where. And so uh, I really encourage you to do that. These cases kind of highlight it as well in these cases. And a Barrett formula, simply saying Barrett formula is the answer, which we all do, of course, uh, is not going to get you out uh, in certain scenarios where there's some uh, some deviations as well. And uh, yeah, we covered a lot of ground. We covered uh, a lot of different cases today. We had cases of angle closure. Uh, we had cases of PIs that went went awry, acute angle closure measurements and, and management, um, IOL repositioning in innovative ways. And I have to say, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the attendees did a great job as well. I was really impressed with all the answers that you guys gave. Uh, and the discussion, which is fantastic, which is what, what it's about. The interaction was great. So thank you all for attending here. Um, this is a great, this is CME approved. Yes, Royal College and equivalent AMA credits, uh, two, two uh, units or two points for the two hours we have spent Balance. here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, you cannot have my email address, Adeep, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can contact uh, right. us through uh, whatever means. I'll try to answer it back. Um, and, uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. Jason is going, Jeb, let's make sure we get Jason Jones, Jason Jones in here from Iowa. 
He's a, he's great. You guys will really enjoy him on, on our on our uh, on our on our webinars. So thanks a lot, Jeb. Do you have any 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 closing comments to make? No, but I mean, listen. Uh, thanks again, everybody, uh, for joining us. We've got a great number today. Um, you know, slowly doing them down, but that's because we kind of went a bit longer than expected. But okay, it's always good. Yeah, great. Now, oh, one thing is next Saturday because of ASCRS, we won't be having uh, a webinar, but we do have one on Wednesday, as mentioned earlier. Yeah. So this Wednesday, we'll we'll, we'll be doing some stuff. Should be good. We always mix a bit of glaucoma and cataract to enter segment. Thank you uh, again. You guys did great, fellows. Tissy, mm -hmm. Valentina, Ala, thank you. It's thank not easy to be put on the spot in front of, you know, 600 people and your colleagues. You guys did fantastic. A lot of great comments about you as well. So thank you for being part of this. The fellows didn't have the uh, didn't have cases beforehand, which I want to keep it natural, which is great. And Dima, always great to see you as well. Thank you, keep safe, keep well in Laval. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago you were, you were, you were in there and actually it's funny because your voice came up on that video. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. I remember that case very well. Yeah. I remember that one. Yes. We had a good chat about all those things and yeah. of course she ended, up, she ended up doing pretty well. Yeah. And George Durr, thank you for joining us as well, man. You, you've been here uh, recently as well and you're always great to be with us. So thank you for being part of it. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Jeb, man. Big, yeah, big shout out to Jeb. He's been uh, doing a lot of, uh, yeah. heavy lifting in the backgrounds there. Baby boss. About him a lot in these Baby years. boss. Yes. Thank you, Jeb. Jeb's been, uh, been incredible. Been we're we're going to have a fun time on surgical feud, which is uh, going to be in yeah. two weeks, I think. Right. Yeah. May 23rd. That'll be, that'll be fun. We'll have a lot of uh, fun things. It'll be a kind of a uh, similar and kind of interesting cases, but they have debates on them by, uh, by world experts. So thank you. Okay, yeah. guys, keep safe. I'll see you uh, on uh, Wednesday. His webinars every day pretty well. So maybe we'll see one of those watch social media. Uh, and, uh, and watch each other. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.